Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod, and we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? What a great name for a show, right? Right. Come on. It's when just it came, natural. I, I, about what, it was three days ago, I was like, Conrad, can we call it Foley is Pod? And you threw me the image like that had already been in the books. I know that you, cause, because it just makes sense. Sure. Right? Foley is Pod. It just yeah. stands out. So I'm, I'm thrilled to do it. It's our first time around. Uh, I've had opportunities in the past, but the time seemed right. And uh, I just kept waiting for our diehard fans to get tired of hearing wrestling stories. But we don't, right? No, we're not going to get tired. We're, we're insatiable for it. We can't get enough. And <laughs> Prime example, as you and I are recording this just last night, I saw your live show. Yeah. It was my sixth time seeing the show. I think it's better than ever. I told you that after the show. And you're still making towns, man. Tell everybody where they can keep keep up with you and see what you're doing Yeah. Uh, you see, you might have caught me. I've got this telltale sign that I'm nervous, which is when I, I blink kind of like in a strange way. It's almost like a facial tick brought on by weariness. So last night on stage, for example, if you saw me go into the face like I was rubbing my eyes, I was actually blinking because I hadn't slept the night before. Wow. And I'd say if you go back and you were to look at footage of every single promo I've ever cut in the four or five seconds before that promo begins, I'm doing this strange blinking thing. So forgive me <coughs> if I blink a little bit, but this is a new terrain for of me. Of course. Uh, but you, so, uh, and we will feel our way through it, hopefully become a beloved part of people's uh, weekly schedule. Uh, but when it comes to my shows, they can go to my uh, website, realmickfoley.com and go to events. And uh, man, we're really running hard through the middle of June and then taking a few months off. But uh, I, you can tell that I love doing yes. the shows. So Conrad, there was this uh, uh, back when I was doing the shows with Bruce, right? Yeah. Uh, so Bruce and I would be terrified because we were outside our comfort zone. Right. I haven't had a drink before a show in years, but when Bruce and I were doing these things, here we are. We both had experience in front of 15, 17,000 people. Bruce had been in front of WrestleMania Stadium. I believe they'd done stadiums by that point. Yeah. And I remember we got 17 people in Worcester, Massachusetts. And here Bruce and I were practically holding on to each other like a mama, mama koala <laughs> and a little baby. Be because we're, we're, we're too scared. We're out of our comfort zone. So I would have one or two drinks and go on. And so Bruce and I did a bunch of these shows. Uh, the guy who booked us, no long, he's no longer, you know, I don't want to denigrate him because he's not here anymore. Um, but they booked it as t- like totally, not not insane, but it was like total, insane, total extreme comedy. And that's not what I do. And right. Bruce is a storyteller like me. Like, right. we're not coming out there and do wacky jokes and, you know, psych gags. Uh, so it wasn't really a great fit. But it was that idea that you're outside the comfort zone, but you're working on something and you're trying in a different way to put smiles on faces. So now, fast forward uh, uh, several months, Bruce and I are in, uh, we're at the Hilton in Las Vegas. And uh, it's the big, it's one of the two or three biggest crowds we did of the dozen or shows. We got wow. about 300 people, but we're in the Ve- we're in the Ve- Vegas Hilton where Elvis used to play. That's where he wow. did his residency. And they've decided that the VIPs, there's like 100 VIPs, they're going to be to the side of the stage. So now we're down to 200 in a 3,500 seat theater. <laughs> And they're scattered around. Yeah. So I guess it gave the woman who reviewed the show the idea that nobody was there. And she hit me with one of the, the, this is one of the lines that just, you know, it stung. It said, the man who used to play to tens of thousands now plays to tens of tens. And it was like, well, first of all, that is true. But it wasn't true that night. Like, right. really, there was there was ten, hundreds, yeah, yeah, hundreds. Um, and I've since come to realize, like, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, last night, I told a little story about uh, my son Huey being my elf. Yeah, on Christmas Eve, and how when we drove away from the house, I said, "Man, I feel like I've had a pay- I've just finished a big pay per view match." And he said, "Dad, like, there was only three people there. It was just one, a dad and two sons." I said, it "Doesn't matter, buddy." It's about creating that moment that you hope they won't forget. So uh, I I, uh, I try not, you know, I try not to make my show 
any deeper. It's supposed to be an escape for people. It is. Relive stories, but that one message that I will I will hit on is don't let other people, you know, decide for you what being a success is. So uh, even on nights when there are tens of tens, and those do happen, I, I, I try to bring the A game. And uh, I tell people, I say, man, uh, there are certain nights when you get that reaction and you're in front of whether it's 70 people or 100. We had about 170. It was, you know, almost packed there last night. Good for, was it Tuesday night or Wednesday night? Yeah, it was Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, yeah, I came out of that with that post-show buzz. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing Jewel perform. And uh, I, I had quoted Jewel's song, Hands. I actually talked about it last night, about how I used to wear the bracelet before it broke that said, only kindness matters, which is a Jewel show. And so uh, my, you know, I remember saying, hey, dude, we should meet. And so I say, uh, hey, this might sound strange, but I'm coming from an event. I might be Santa Claus. And my wife goes, oh, that's the last time she'll ever talk to you. <laughs> And then Jewel responds with a DM is like, oh, like, I think I adore you. Like, she loved that stuff, you know, yeah. the writing the letter to her son, uh, Santa. And so I'm just, I just want to remark on the fact that when the next time I came to see, oh, it was that night, you do the customary, well, nice to meet you. And sure. after five minutes, you don't want to tell, you kind of know when your, when your time is done. And every time I kept excusing ourselves, me, my, it was my daughter, Noelle, my wife, she goes, no, no, sit down. So, you know, she basically spent the entire hour with the Foley family. And we walk away thinking, we've got a new friend in Jewel. Right. The next time I, I saw her on the road, uh, you know, is before uh, I bequeathed to her my album collection. So oh, cool. Jewel has the Jewel and uh, Alicia Warrington, who is Alicia Taylor on NXT. They own the Foley album collection, the Foley <laughs> vinyl collection, right? What a, what a what a weird world it is, right? Jewel and Alicia Taylor have the Foley albums. But when I came back to see Jewel after the show, she had that post-show glow. Wow. It was really cool to be part of that. So you see after all these years, you know, when someone loves performing, they've got that glow about them. And I had that last night. You saw me afterwards, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, you were on cloud nine. I couldn't have been happier. Yeah. And so going back to going back to what the woman said about tens of tens, you know, I, I, here's an interesting thing. We might be able to do this on a future show. And I know people tune in is like, all right, so Foley's talking about Jewel and Santa Claus. <laughs> we want you to be thrown off the top of that cell. We like that guy. <laughs> and we'll get to that guy. Um, but when I did my, my Santa memoir, right. Yeah. Knowing full well that this is a very limited audience. And I hedged my bets when I vowed, I'm going to donate all of the money to, uh, you know, children's uh, charitable organizations that deal with, uh, Christmas, you know, whether it's child, you know, Santa's elves incorporated and in, out of Santa Claus, Indiana, which write letters to, uh, children, That's awesome. uh, and also, you know, and then a few charities that help, uh, less fortunate uh, during the holidays because that's important. Um, but I also realized it's not like, I'm I'm hedging my bets. This is not going to be the big seller where I go, oh, my goodness, what did I do? Why did I do that? Uh, that's a lot of money to be given away. So I know it's a limited audience. Uh, when I did the uh, audio, I broke down when I read the last page where I was talking about visit visiting a boy at his home, a boy who had cancer. He was so exhausted when I saw him in the hospital a couple days before Christmas. I thought, this poor kid's not going to remember anything about this visit. So I said to his mom, I said, uh, would he like a visit, you know, on Christmas Eve? Problem was Christmas Eve rolls around, Christmas Day rolls around, and uh, there's no answer from the family. So I, I call the uh, hospital. I speak to the head of a, a child life department. And she says, well, you know, he uh, family doesn't mind if I say his name. Brandon, Brandon just went home late on Christmas Eve. I said, well, see if he'd like a visit on Christmas Day. And the mom gets back to her. She relates the message. Well, they would love it, but it's Christmas Day. And this is where I want people. This is, I know I jump around a little bit. Stephanie McMahon wrote in the uh, in the forward to that book, and she wrote a great forward. She said, uh, "I've known Mick Foley for over twenty years, and all that time he hasn't changed." She used like three words of high praise for me, and she said, 
and somehow simultaneously naive, you know, like all at the same time. And then she said, and if you pushed my hand, I'd say a little strange. And I was so glad that she said that because the wrestling's a home for outcasts, of right? Of course. Especially the stuff I did as mankind that connected, really connected. Yeah. I was just, I was just trying to keep my head above water in the attitude era. Like I didn't know when I decided to make mankind a little uh kinder and gentler right. that I was connecting with people that didn't feel like they had a place. And so I, if I can uh, spread a message, it's embrace the things that make you strange. Uh, right. Don't shy away from them. I was so glad Stephanie wrote that because I said to my wife, I said, every positive thing that's ever happened to me has come about because of behavior that could be categorized as strange. Wow. So when I respond to this, you know, the child life person and I say, uh, Tell that family there's no place I'd rather be on Christmas Day than at their home with their child. That sounds like the words of a crazy man, right? Right. Uh, so when I said, I remember there was a little girl named Ursula, and she was born, she loved Santa. I even did a bonus chapter in the paperback so the, called The Girl Who Loves Santa Claus. She loved Santa to the point where I would write a letter and like send her a gift for halfway to Christmas. And then you're, I, I'm doing it out of the goodness of my heart, but we all still love the acknowledgement. Sure. And after five days, there's no acknowledgement of the gift. So I said, how does Ursula enjoy a gift? And the mom writes back, we don't know. She won't open it. She carries it everywhere with her. Wow. So it brought her so much happiness just to have it. Yeah. And uh, uh, that she wouldn't open it. So this girl just positively loved Santa. Wow. And so when I, I did the same thing when I met the mom and I saw how taken the little girl who wasn't supposed to talk, who the parents were told should live out her days in a home because her d disabilities were so uh, severe or challenges, I think we call them these days, so severe. So when I committed to doing a visit on Christmas Eve, she said, okay, um, I, and I'm sure it'll be a quick visit. Uh, I know you have to be with your family. And I said, the visit may be five minutes. It may be an hour. It will be however long it needs to be to be the best visit I can give to your child. Yeah. And so my wife goes, you sound like a crazy man. And like, yeah, oh, I, I do, I do, you know? And if you take it the wrong way, it sounds like there's something wrong. But going back to the behaviors, like, well, everything I've ever done that has meant something has come about because of behavior that could be labeled strange. So just fast forward, going back to the, the chapter about the boy in the house, I get there, it's about 6 p.m. And I said in the book, uh, I think I referred in uh, the Have a Nice Day to having a, a list of goals right. that I wrote down and how as time went on, I was able to check off almost all those goals. Ma main event, Madison Square Garden, headline a pay-per-view that does X number of buys. I know it was 300,000, whatever, like check, 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 check. And I also had a list of the greatest things I thought I'd ever accomplished. So there was Beach Blast 92, uh, the match with Shawn Michaels in 96, the sit down interview from April 97 with JR. And I said, if I can ever find that list at the bottom, I'm going to put visit to Brandon's house because I was in the zone that night, right? Like I, one of the best performances I ever did. And uh, there's only five people there. All three women have tears streaming down their cheeks and there's six people that the, the uh, uh, Brandon and his sister and, uh, and the dad. Uh, and I was just on top of the world that night. So when I go to read the, the final page, I talk about the goals. And I also talk about being at WrestleMania in Dallas in 2016 and how my, first of all, I should have gone first. Sean should have gone second, right? That should have been the hierarchy. Why they had Sean come out for, I don't know. You know, Steve rightfully comes out last. And I know as soon as that glass breaks, not a soul in the place is going to be looking at me, right? <laughs> Honestly. And last night I talked about just looking, seeing faces and being able to connect. But now I got the luxury of time where I can look around 101,000 people, even if it was a slight, I don't know. I've heard it was slightly exaggerated. There were a lot of people a bunch there. Of folks, a yeah. lot of folks there. You have a great way of putting it. And I just looked around and I thought, I've never been in front of a crowd like this. 
before. I will never be in front of a crowd like this again. I'm going to take it all in. Good. I also had the luxury of knowing I was on the no touch list. <laughs> Seamus had firmly instructed me to hit me as hard as he as I could, fella, and then made it clear that he would be angry with me if I didn't, you know, just by looking at me, he goes, hard as you can. I said, Seamus, I don't think I need to do that and make it look good. He goes, as hard as you can, fella. I was like, Hey, man, I've got instructions. So now I was able to just enjoy that moment because I don't have to worry about making my stuff look good. Sure. By virtue of the fact that I'm going to hit them as hard as I can repeatedly, it's going to look pretty good. Uh, and I also referred back to the goal I had of selling out Madison Square Garden and how it more than lived up to my expectations. But then I said, but if you ask me, was it better than being in that kid's house, that child's house? Wow in front of five people. And that's when I broke down. I was like, I can't tell you that it was. So that's one thing if you're listening and you're in a car, wherever you happen to might be, and it feels like life's got you down a little bit, just remember, uh, you get to define what being a success is. And for me, like everyone's a success if they just make the world a slightly better place for, for all mankind. All right, through with my lecture. Uh, you're probably shaking your head going, oh, no, no, we can roll into? the credits right now. I mean, you, you are the, uh, the most genuine person in wrestling, the most beloved person in wrestling. And I can't believe I get to sit here and do this with you. It's an honor. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking, wait a second. Conrad does a podcast with DDP. I'm apologizing <laughs> for, for saying something that might be construed as inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I, like I said, when I come to the shows, that's not the goal. The goal is to entertain and make people forget about uh, the the real world out there, and that's what I hope we're doing in a sense. Absolutely, yeah, that's, we uh, are. Why you've had this great great success? So I'm glad to be part of the team. All right, Mick, it's time. All of our listeners have been wondering when I was going to get you uh, smartened up about this. Are you familiar with Blue Chew? I've heard of it. Well, now you're going to learn all about it. This is like a hot tag for your wiener, Mick. <laughs> okay. Are they going to use that in there? Yeah. Here's the deal, boys and girls. You know all about Blue Chew. Even Mick does. And, and Mick is, is a podcast rookie here, right? But yeah. you know this episode sponsored by Blue Chew. You knew that as soon as you clicked play and you saw my name. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but it's chewable tablets. And Mick, you'll love this at a fraction of the cost. Fraction of the cost, really? Now, I like that. Now, here's the real reason on that, Mick. They have. They are basically offering like almost the generic version. So it's the same stuff if you use Viagra and Cialis, but now it's in chewable form, which means you can take it on an empty stomach. You can take it day or night. You can be ready whenever an opportunity arises, or maybe it's time for that elusive run in. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, Just, that's boom. right. The Good hot tag, come in, the house of fire. Yeah, working from underneath, going over. I mean, we can get it all in here. The process is simple, guys. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll, re you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part, Mick. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And I know this is important to you, Mick. BlueChew's tablets are made right here in the USA. The good old red, white, and blue chew. It's prepared and ship directly to your door all in a discreet package but mr foley there won't be anything discreet about your package with blue chew so uh <laughs> boys and girls check this out if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform blue chew can help and we've got a special deal for our listeners try blue chew for free can you beat that price you man? can't beat it but you got to have the disclaimer about side effects right side effects include smacking the mat Yes. Firing up into a fighting position and saying, come on, and rushing your hair. Come on, you son of a yeah. cock, come on. And if you're not careful, an accidental eye poke. <laughs> I mean, you never know. You just never know. Come on, boys and girls. Try this out for free. You can't beat free. All you got to do is use our promo code Foley at checkout. Now, you will have to pay $5 shipping, but why would you not do that? Why come on would now. you not do it? It's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley. You receive your first month for free. Just visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. And apparently, Mrs. Foley's baby's boy's baby boy. I don't know, but you're going home with some today, and I'm going to need to report back. I am a scientist. 
Okay. Uh, I can almost assure you that you are going to become my wife's least favorite person. Really? <laughs> by virtue of giving me. You're going to be pestering her all the time? Uh, possibly. Hey. Here's what's good about you in particular. Uh, you had three bites at the apple at the Royal Rumble. Yeah. I mean, I think if I'm thinking what you're thinking and you're thinking what I'm I thinking. I think I am thinking what I think you think I'm thinking. We start with, with Cactus Jack. Maybe we transition to Mankind. We finish with Dude Love or vice versa. Just switch it up. Just use promo code Foley at BlueChew.com. Man, we're excited to have you. And our topic today is No Way Out 2000. This is your first retirement match. Uh, you're fresh <laughs> off of uh, the Royal Rumble at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. That, that main event with Hunter that I know we'll talk about sometime. Probably my favorite match of yours. Just yeah. such a spectacle. Um, but the next night you're in Philadelphia, your old stomping grounds. And Philadelphia has been such a special part of your career, has it not? Was I in Philadelphia or was I in Baltimore? I thought you were in Philly. I can't kind of sworn I I stayed over my friend Chris Walker's that night. Uh, I will have to go back and look. Sure, but Baltimore, Philly, not far away. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was hurt. Wow, I was hurting. That's one of the things I think that's always been most difficult about uh, wrestling. We are filming this with three days after the Super Bowl. Yep. And of course, uh, the, the Rams had the benefit of being in L.A. You know, yes. or Disneyland. So. But traditionally, the uh, MVP has asked, you know, you just won the Super Bowl. You know, what are you doing? He's, I'm going. I'm going to Disney. Where's land? Disneyland. I'm going to Disney World. For us, it's you know, you just you know, you just thrown off a massive steel structure. You know, you can barely function. How are you going to celebrate? I'm getting up in the morning. I'm driving a couple hundred miles. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow on live national TV. Yeah. And so I was really hurting, trying to get up mentally again, because it should be, you should peak and have some time mm -hmm. to relax. So I did have that opportunity in 2006 when Edge and I had that, uh, I'll say it was a classic match. Of right? course. It goes down in history as a classic match. Um, and I was able to just lay in bed in Chicago. And by that point, WWE, I think, was, they were at a point where they could work the venue the same venue the next night right and now it's even a better opportunity because they go from sixty thousand to seventy five thousand, and then it's not so difficult to convince one fifth of those people to stick around for right. a night or two or three uh but it used to be difficult to get in that car not that i wrestled at, at, at mania in uh 96 because i actually debuted the, the next night day after. yeah okay. the night after and so, uh, so there's that story in the book about uh, uh, getting in the car with Vader. And uh, uh, I'd been at the Hilton in um, Anaheim, which I looked over the parking lot at Disneyland. At that time, they refurbished the Disneyland so much that it doesn't anymore. Just longingly looking at Disneyland. And I finally, on like the night before Mania, I think I did go over there and I just thought, ah, there's worse things a married guy can do than sure. go to Disney without his kids. Um, but I debuted the next night uh, at Mania. It, it wasn't it wasn't what it is now. Right. It was two or three days. It was some activity. It was a couple signings. Nothing for me because I was debuting a new character. And uh, it was, I remember... I'm jumping around a little bit. That's right. That Bruce called me because he'd heard that I debuted the Mankind gimmick at ECW. And so people thought it was a Mankind gimmick because nobody knew what the Mankind gimmick was. Right. And I was wearing the boots. I see. I wanted to get used to the boots because the idea at that time was I was going to I was going to wrestle with lifts on. Okay. So that I could be taller and look more menacing for The Undertaker. First time in your career. Yeah, point, yeah. Right? First, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was a legit 6'4 when I worked, but I hunched over, I was gnarled over. And I think because when I came into the picture in WWE, I was immediately with Undertaker. People had in their minds, well, even before then, because I think I was the only guy billed to be shorter than he actually was. Right. I was billed at 6'2 because I think Howard Finkel thought I was 5'10". A lot of people think I'm a lot shorter than I am. But I'm now I'm not 6'4 anymore, probably 6'2 and a half with the, the shrinkage that occurs, you know, as we age and when sure. you uh, perpetuate it by doing ridiculous things <laughs> off the, the ring apron. Um, but uh, I get in the car with Leon and WWE takes care of the everything but incidentals. They take care of the room. Uh, they take care of, uh, you know, your flights. 
Uh, we usually d did not have the room taken care of us for us, except, except if you're doing media appearances, right. mania, I think SummerSlam a couple years later. So I've been there for, for four or five days and I've got like $36 in bills, right? I've got just a, maybe one room service meal. I always had protein bars or I went, you know, I packed stuff, you know, I was. You're I, fruit? I was fruit. fruit. I'm, not as, I'm not like I, I'm not like that anymore. I'm a three star man. There you, you know? go. I do remember I uh, when Ric Flair had to, uh, he was asked to make some appearances in uh, Europe with WWE that I inherited a couple, I didn't inherit them, Rick gifted them to me, his appearances. And I looked at the rider and I was like, I don't want a five-star room. Like, I don't I don't want a hotel with a huge lobby. You know, I, I so I was like, okay, this looks great, but I want a three-star hotel. I'm a three-star man, you know. Once, if I'm with the family, I'll go with the fancy thing. But if it's just me, I want to be able to get in the lobby, be in the, my room within a minute. You know? There you go. Um, but Leon gets in the car and he says, will you uh, hold on to this? And he hands me his expense report from his room. And it pra all, it does everything but unroll like a sacred scroll. <laughs> he had, it was a lot of mini bar things. It was room service. It was $250 for a pair of sunglasses. Leon had rung up a $2,500 bill in four days. Yours was 36 And, and mine was 36 And I thought to myself, this partnership is not going to last very long because we're going to be living in exact opposite. For a couple of weeks, you know, I would drop Leon off and then uh, I would go to the budget motel. He had a pretty good deal, I think, with Marriott at the time. But really what doomed that car riding relationship was Leon's penchant for uh, singing with his shirt off. Oh. And he would get the chips all like they'd be all matted in his chest hair. And he was just brutalizing beloved 70s songs that I love. <laughs> like to this day, Cat Stevens comes on with Wild World, and all I think is Leon, you know, belting out that tune. Uh, where were we, Conrad, with uh, the uh, Oh, yeah. Philadelphia. Me, that, was, that was my long way of saying that uh, it was difficult to hit that peak again. So right. in that case, I was not right. I was debuting the day after Mania, but for everyone else, you know, they had hit that mania high. You go to the post mania party, which was always a great time. Vince didn't spare any expenses, especially on the shrimp cocktail. <laughs> and I, I just talking to my kids how about I haven't been to a post WrestleMania party in over 10 years. Wow. Because in 2014, I had my youngest son, uh, Huey, with me, and uh, he was too young to go to the party. Uh, my older kids went, and I stayed with him, and I just, kept reinforcing like you know why dad's here right like would you rather stay with me yes remember that as you get older your dad yeah. sacrificed the post wrestlemania party but going back to the idea of going to that well again it was always really difficult to do that and that's what i had to do after this big epic match when i really should by all rights have earned you know the the right to just lay in bed all day i've got to go to either philadelphia or baltimore I thought it was Baltimore because I stayed with my friend Chris Walker and um, I had to make a save. Uh, and uh, I don't, you can fill me in on the details who I was saving. Um, but so what happens is the main event of the show is Triple H and Big Show taking on The Rock and Rikishi. And the outlaws are going to attack uh, Rock and Rikishi and you make the save. And in your book, Foley is Good, you wrote that whatever goodwill you had the previous night was gone. <laughs> because my stuff looked so weak. I don't, I, I can't go back and watch it. I got reprimanded. Vince was angry at me for not laying the stuff in. I think I had, a, you know, garbage cans. I had a potpourri of uh, inter interesting objects, and I didn't lay the stuff in. Vince was angry because I'd gone to such extreme lengths uh, to to make that match with Triple H we both had, right? Sure. Triple H had that big jagged shard of wood in his gaff when I Brutal. suplexed him on the pallet and content, not only continued the match, but made the injury part of the match. So he was great and one of the great ring generals of all time. I know sometimes there'd be some debate as where Triple H belongs. on that. But you list, were in right? there, you know. I was in there, man. It, you take someone who can bring out the best in his opponents, and that's that's – that's one of those great attributes for an all-time great, which Triple H was. But uh, I guess I didn't do myself any favors 
with what I did in that ring. I guess I was reverting back in a way to what people, the cynics think wrestling is. Right. I think there was some foot stomping going on, you know, and I just, I don't know. I, I, it's like you, everybody would have understood. We got another main event to build. Uh, I think everybody would have understood if uh, they'd come out of there a little sore and I'd laid that stuff in a little excessively, but I can't go back and watch it. I have never gone back and watched from a performance standpoint. Does that come down to you being invested in the creative? Like obviously the main event uh, in Madison square garden and, and a world title match like that, the brutal street fight, that seems like something you would really get into mentally and you're just become obsessed with it versus yeah. this is, well, it's a run in on TV. It's just not the same. It's not the same. Yeah. And I just wasn't there emotionally. Um, Man, I maybe there's some studies that could be done, and I'm not trying to say WWE needs to change what they do, but right. maybe they take into consideration that if you're in a brutal match, uh, Edge had to wrestle the next night after yeah. our match in 2006. It's like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's fair, you know, on an emotional level. In, or the audience, or, if they're yeah, not going to yeah. get the guy at his best. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was like, we got to figure out a way to perpetuate storylines without matches. So I'm not excusing what I did that night in Philadelphia or Baltimore, because apparently it was dreadful. Um, but the guys that have to go out there and perform, like, we got a big roster. You know, you take away those four or five guys. And besides, I'm not a fan of group granting rematches the day after mania right so i think that comes around to bite you eventually yeah when people go well, what am i why was i so invested last yeah, time yeah why was i invested why was i paying if i right. know there's a pattern of getting those matches within a day or two so i'm just curious as so we're trying to set the stage here because we know we're going to be talking about a retirement match i'm just curious did you know going into royal rumble i'm probably re ready to wind it down or are you hurting as a result of that match? And then you come back through the curtain and Vince is very unhappy with what happened. And you think, you know, maybe now's time. When does it start to enter your mind that I'm getting close here? Well, kind of, I'm trying to go back in time and recall if I knew that, uh, that we were going to follow up the rumble with the hell in a cell right or whether we, i'd have to go back i think uh eddie guerrero had an injury no no that was later eddie came in later the uh, elbow injury there may have been some deciding factor that uh there was a big deciding factor and i wrote about this and man i'm not here to hurt big shows feelings or you know but at that time it was thought people had gotten in his brain you know it really messed with him not intentionally in trying to in trying to make him the best best big show that he could be. Now you've you got to be more aggressive, which meant faster. So now you got a, the biggest man on the planet, and he's instead of one real deliberate and effective boot, he thinks he's got his he's got to deliver five or six of them fast, and he was just losing course. And that's when Vince asked me and I pulled me and Hunter aside and said. Man, I need a. Steve had been hurt, and they need something to carry them over to Mania season. And he pulled us aside, and at that point, it was Vince's belief that the show wasn't on that level that he wanted needed him to be. And uh, I had essentially retired a couple months earlier. I had I was heavy. I my knees were really hurting. Um, I had made what I think was a really bad, uh, there was a really pivotal moment, Conrad, where I ha I should have realized, okay, I'm as more over than I could have. I don't want to say could have dreamed, but I probably dreamed I could be more over <laughs> than I realistically <laughs> thought, you know, this, this thing is going so well. I felt like I needed to be 275, 280 when I came into the company. I need like, uh, you know, I, 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 I held 275, 280 after I left WCW. I held it for those 15 months. I got myself into what I thought, you know, was really good shape for my ECW run, my uh, IWA Japan run, did the indies, really wanted to try to make every match as good as I could. Um, but going down below that, I thought it would have been counterproductive to facing The Undertaker. Like right. I needed that little bit of padding. But once I got that over and I started having problems with my knees, I should have realized fans are going to accept me at 250. 
Right. You know, like I should have done whatever I could to go down 20, 30 pounds. Instead, when I put on 20 or 30 pounds, it really started having an effect on my knees. Uh, if you look back at all those matches I did after maybe my first year in the company where I wore knee pads, no knee pads. So there's that famous photo of uh, DX holding me aloft and ra- road dog shouting in the, you know, in the background. Uh, and I've got the title held up in the air. Um, and you can see just uh, no knee pads, a hole in the brown tights. And I went in the last two or three years of my run there in WWE without any knee pads constantly hitting hitting the not just the mat but the concrete outside and just little by little all these little cracks start forming in my knees to where when i had them examined um the doctor orthopedic guy whose name will come to me is i was his first patient and when i was 12 years old i broke my thumb as a cat dr liguri calls over his uh his colleagues and they all marvel at this 34 year old man with the 80 year old knees wow they were just, they looked arthritic to the point where they it's what you usually see in somebody much older so it was brought on by all those um the real physical style and i wouldn't say i was taking risks when i was dropping to my knees outside but i realized trauma to the yeah, knees. trauma to the knees and when i did the cactus clothesline after the first maybe 10, 12 times where I was really out of control doing it, meaning in a good way. I mean, I was taking my risks on that one. And then I started holding on longer, uh, which lessens the risk, but also understanding and fully appreciating that when I did that, I'd be hitting my thighs hard on the uh, apron. Mm -hmm. And then that creates these bruises and discomforts. And so I was really uncomfortable and a lot of pain when I was coming down to that final end. Uh, but in either October or November, uh, we can check back because it was that historic night uh, that Bruce has probably talked about where I said, I don't know, I'm supposed to be searching for Val Venus and like the bowels. That was the, this was in Philadelphia. And he takes me like to this, you know, the seedy uh uh, it's kind of you know, like uh, the bowels, the inner workings, you know, peep shows and things like that. And I said, Bruce, I don't know. Like, you know, mankind's kind of become this family friendly right. character. And now I'm searching for Val Venus in peep shows and I'm opening up the curtains. <laughs> you know, we, we got guys with their pants down <laughs> at their ankles. And then I say, oh, I start getting into the thing. Bruce, I need as many quarters as you can get me, you know? So after Ripper, you pervert this. And then I opened up one of the things. I yanked the guy out of there. And I said, is that Kay Parker? Kay Parker was a great <laughs> starlet of the late 70s. And now when they cut away, I'm coming running out. And I've got quarters falling out of my pocket, giving the illusion I've been in there for hours. You know? And uh, I think they're towing the car. And I said, wait, wait. And I think I, I, I said to Bruce after the car gets towed, I said, Bruce, uh, did you know that I was going to get like that emotionally? Oh, yeah, yeah. We just we gave you lip service. Okay, Mick, we'll do the family-friendly PG stuff while you're searching the bowels of the building. And we'll just count on you being the type of guy who will run out of a building with a pocket full of quarters. <laughs> but what was pivotal about, pivotal, pivotal about that night was that um, that was the night Al Snow and I worked with Bob and Crash Holly. And I was SmackDown taping, and I fell down twice in the match. Couldn't the the uh, patented uh, catch the boot, spin me around, but I come back with the clothesline. There you go. Which D, your friend DDP took like the day after I left WCW in 94. And I was like, DDP, you're taking all my stuff. He's like, well, bro, you're not here anymore. I was like, <laughs> one day I might be back again, and I right. might like to have that stuff. Yeah, yeah, DDP had never done that catch the boot <laughs> spin clothesline. <laughs> And he may have added, added this business to it, but um, I talked to Vince. I was so embarrassed that night. I said, Vince, man, I I think I got to hang up the boots. At that point, it was the sneakers, which I started wearing because of the problems with the knees. And that's where he encouraged me to um, drop some pounds. And I said, Vince, I can't remember where I live anymore. Oh. He says, what's that? I said, I drive past my house. Like, I can't remember things. And he said, you've just had your last match. Wow. So that's when people talk about Vince being selfish and driving people too hard. I'll counter with, all right, maybe there are elements of that. 
But when push came to shove and he heard that one of his guys was having trouble with his memory, it was more important to him that I be healthy than that I continue to make money for the company. Sure. And so I would have retired uh, if Steve hadn't been hurt, if they didn't need somebody to pull together, you know, as a as a team, and if Vince hadn't made the determination that Shell wasn't where he needed him to be, that's when he pulled me and Hunter together and said, you know, how do you guys feel about working together? Yeah, man, I loved it because we'd had the, the run in 97. Um, and, you know, with DX, we'd been in there a lot together. We had good chemistry. So, yeah, let's, let's do it. So that uh, epic Royal Rumble uh, resulted in the, uh, again, I wish I knew whether we knew before the Rumble or it was immediately afterwards we're going to do the uh, we're going to do the retirement match because the ultimate goal was still to retire, and we're just going to push that off by uh, by four months. So that's what I was looking at. I dropped I dropped probably about 25, 30 pounds, 25 pounds, 30, maybe thirty pounds over the course of six weeks. My wife and I had a gym, uh, Foley's gym in Navarre, Florida. So uh, because I was the owner, I would go in after hours, and I worked really hard on the car on the cardio aspect so that I could go. And I felt like uh, we were able to go that night, um, not only at Royal Rumble, but at No Way Out. How was she thinking about you perhaps considering retirement? Did she think it was long overdue or what was her plans? Uh, she was really concerned uh, as a wife and as the mother of two small children, you know, her husband really having these difficulties. So she understood. Vince said something to me, it sounded crazy at the time. He may have said he he may have not have said this at the exact time I retired. It may have been months later. But he said, "You make what you've done here is going to allow you to make a living for the next ten years." And I thought, "No, I think I've got an, about an eighteen month shelf life to capitalize on what it is I did." I thought that ten year thing was. Uh, did he mean like the convention circuit and all that? Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, indies, uh, I don't even know what there were conventions at that time. I, I wasn't aware. Uh, I was aware of uh, San Diego Comic Con only been 10,000 people because I did it in 99 when um, they had the, that little run of uh, WWE comics. So I had a comic. I did the uh, San Diego Comic Con so with only 10,000 people there, which is a big Comic Con, but sure. now it's up around 125,000 yeah. something, you know ridiculous so it wasn't cons weren't on my radar but you know to make guest appearances on independent shows and dennis brent was uh head of uh he wasn't the head of talent relations but he booked talent for outside appearances okay and at that point wow you know just uh running the roads in a way that the other guys couldn't because when uh, when when uh conventions now i'm talking about auto auto shows things of monster truck shows things like that the other superstars who were near the top of the card or at the top of the card they can't do this because they're working every friday saturday sunday Monday, you know four days a week sometimes more and i'm the guy who's just left the top of the world and i can do anything but i'm not doing it with any rhyme or geographic reason it's just hopping on a plane i was in huntsville the day before uh no way out Okay. I was at a car show in Huntsville. World of Wheels. Day, World of Wheels. Yeah. I was there the day before, and I look back on that, and I said, why wasn't I in a nice hotel right, right before, like, resting up? Why was I getting on a plane the yeah. day of this match and flying back? There's no direct flight from Huntsville to to to, uh, to Hartford. There no. was probably two layovers, or maybe yeah. at least one, but you're spending at least six or seven hours of the biggest day of your life traveling to that show so i it was like one of those things where i'm making too much money to t you know at that point the money you could make for one of those shows hard to say no hard to say no to that because you don't know how if i had known that wow here i am in 2022 so vince was wrong it wasn't 10 years it was 22 Decades. and counting yeah that i'm still able to do well i may have uh not taken <laughs> that event the day before the biggest show of my <laughs> Sorry, life. Sorry, World yeah. Wheels. Yeah. But it was, uh, I think, 2001, I actually had my biggest WWE year ever. And I wasn't, and I only had, oh, 2000. I had the big run, 2000 and 2001. 
I had two of my biggest years without really wrestling. Did four matches, I think, in 2000. Remarkable. None in 2001, but I was traveling the country and the world. Went over to Australia for WWE, Southeast Asia uh, for WWE to promote the brand. And man, I was, I was logging some serious miles. Retirement didn't really mean retirement. No, it yeah. didn't at all. And and even when I, I remember getting home and uh, we, you know, I marked out, really thought I was the WWF commissioner. And so we bought a house in Long Island, bigger than I wanted to. But part of the reason I bought it was some property was because I didn't want to leave it. I just wanted to be like Howard Hughes and scones in my own like uh, private Xanadu. And after about three weeks, my kids were like, Dad, can we go somewhere? I was like, well, we don't have to go somewhere. I'm home now. Right. I'm home. Because as super dad, whenever I was home, you know, when I was over off the road, I would always spend that first day doing something fun. Arn Anderson told me that. He said, just make sure you, no matter how tired you are, you make your presence known that first day. Get the family, take them out to lunch or breakfast, whatever it might be, and be that guy that day you can get your rest that night later on the next day you can take your nap do whatever you need to do but that first day do it for the family it's good advice good advice if you're out there and you're a young wrestler and you're listening good advice be that guy and wear knee pads and wear knee so pads. make after a big match back <laughs> oh, in the man. day you know it's been said once upon a time especially in new york vince would take the guys out for a big steak maybe once upon a time it was smith and walensky something like that everybody loves steak do they not oh man I was at Smith and Walensky's uh, with Al Snow and Kevin Kelly, and Mr. McMahon walked in with a bunch of people, and then he, uh, word came over that he was picking up our check. Wow. I'd never been so embarrassed, because this is Smith and Walensky, one of the top steakhouses in New York City and the country, Yeah. and the bill for three people was $37. So we were going cheeseburger, water with lemon in it. Yeah, so we were there. I think if you want to enjoy some of the finer things, you need to go with Omaha Steaks. Omaha Steaks is going to get you the same great steak that you've been dreaming of, but boy, it comes right to your house. And here's a little gift-giving wisdom from Omaha Steaks. Dads want steaks. And with Father's Day right around the corner, there isn't a better gift than Omaha Steaks. Visit omahasteaks.com and type Foley in the search bar and order the Dads Want Steaks package. For just 99 bucks, this limited package will include 16 mouthwatering entrees he's guaranteed to love. We're talking smoky, tender wrap bacon fillets, gourmet jumbo franks, and their air-chilled boneless chicken breasts. And for a sweet finish, what about those delicious caramel apple tartlets? I'm getting hungry just thinking about it, Mick. And as a special gift for our listeners, when you type Foley, that's F-O-L-E-Y in the search bar, and you order the Dad's Want Steaks package, you'll also get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. These burgers are full of bold, beefy flavor made from 100% Omaha Steaks, and now they're bigger than ever at a whopping six ounces. Six. Six ounces? Six ounces. Come on now. We're not talking about a quarter pounder. We're talking about a quarter and a half pounder. This is a lot of poundage here. A lot. Right? I'm just saying, don't wait. Send dad more than a gift. Send him an experience he'll love and can share with you. You see, that's the pro tip right there, Mick. Because if you just get dad a tie, when are you ever going to get to enjoy that tie? But if, if you get dad Omaha steaks, he's going to grill them. He's going to invite you over. You're eating good, too. It's kind of a gift for both of you. I have to you. tell you, as a guy who's tr- who has been cutting down on the meat consumption, you need to take that, that steak experience and make it something special. Yes. That's why when it comes to red meat, if it's not Whataburger and it's not Omaha, I don't know if I can take part. I got to recommend it. Go to omahasteaks.com, type Foley in the search bar, and order the Dad's Want Steaks package. You'll get 16 entrees and four desserts, plus eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. Omaha Steaks isn't just steak. It's the best steak of your life, guaranteed. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword Foley. It's interesting that we're we're here talking about your retirement match because this is the same time when you're on the cover of TV Guide, and obviously that's not really something people talk about, you know, here in 2022. But at the time, it had arguably the widest distribution yeah. of any publication, and there you are on the cover. I mean, this is the equivalent of 
you know, going out on top in any other sport too, right? TV guide. Yeah. It's yeah. funny because I'm i uh, I've become something of a friends fanatic after watching their reunion, uh, got a crush on Janice, you know, she was the, Oh my God, Chandler Bing. So yeah, I was like, Oh God, I long for Janice. And I think that's a crush that any wife would be like, let him long for Janice, you know, sure. like uh, she's a character from a show. Um, and they referred to TV Guide many times. So it was like he was getting it for free under the name Chenandler Bong. <laughs> it was like a quiz show episode where <laughs> Chenandler Bong. But the TV Guide was what you did. That's how you picked out your shows. Yeah. And to be on the cover of that was like up there with being on the cover of People. Yeah. Yeah, it was like being on the cover of People. And uh, I think I'd actually been on it twice. I think I'd been on it in 1999. Strangest strangest pick ever it was uh it was me rock steve sable and the cat or the cat may have been on the second <laughs> run you know i think the set no the second run was just me and the rock and it was um it was a presidential election year and so we were both on separate covers like you know vote for mankind vote right the rock type of thing so things were going so fast at the time, I don't know if you could fully appreciate it. I have since said that uh, part of the challenge when you're in WWE is to both, it says that now we're going drifting to an amusement park analogy, given Mr. McMahon's penchant for talking about grabbing for the brass ring. Does anyone even know what that is anymore? No. Okay. No. Uh, Knobles Grove, if you watch Holy Foley and we're on the carousel, you can actually see us reaching for the brass ring. These were old school uh, carousels and they would go around and an, a mechanical arm would come out with a brass ring at its end. So the idea is you reach for the brass ring with your finger and you pull it out. It's a little dangerous because you're encouraging people to lean over enough that they could fall off their horse. I'm sure there have been injuries in the past. So nobody really reaches for the brass ring unless you're at Knobles Grove Amusement Resort in Elysburg, Pennsylvania, then you can reach for the brass ring. <laughs> but that's what it is. You're reaching for it. You're trying to be the best you can be. You're reaching for the brass ring. And I, so I said, now the challenge is to both reach for the brass ring, meaning you're trying to be the best you can be while simultaneously stopping to smell the roses. There you go. And it's really difficult to do that mm -hmm. simultaneously. Which is why you're at World of Wheels the night before. Why you're at the World Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're not necessarily appreciating everything you have while you're, you're reaching it. for the brass You're ring. reaching for it. You're so busy about the competition. And uh, I've seen so many guys, you know, who, look, I'm, I love WWE, but I'm sure we're in our partnership, I'll badmouth them occasionally when I think, not, or criticize them, not yeah, badmouth yeah. them. But they're a great company. And I think we all, uh, when we're there, fail to appreciate everything about it. But if we completely appreciate it and we're content, then we can't reach for the brass ring. Yeah. But I think by and large, when guys are done with their runs, they look back on those days as some of the best, not just of their career, but of their lives. And I've we seen, fans do too. Yeah. So oh, th thank you. Yeah. yeah. And it's a shame. It's a shame. You can't do both simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, you can try. Uh, you can try to, you know, you can try to stop at museums along the way, but by and large, most guys are going to see the gym, the, hotel. the airport, yeah. the hotel, maybe the bar afterward, although that's changed a lot over the years. Yeah. Uh, a tanning bed and, uh, and the arena, that's yeah, it. And the arena. And after 20 or 25 years, you really haven't seen anything but the highways. Yeah. It's just the nature of the beast. So there's a lot going on in wrestling at the time. WCW is going through some pretty massive changes. Vince Russo all of a sudden has quit. And now there's unconditional releases for Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, and Perry Saturn. Now, also given releases at the time were Shane Douglas, Conan, and Billy Kidman. Um, I know you're maybe one foot out here, um, but are you in contact with any of those guys? Shane Douglas jumps off the page knowing yeah. your history. Did you have a conversation about what might be happening next for them? I don't recall that with Shane. I think Eddie and uh, Dean and Perry and Chris, I think 
they were really unhappy with because if you were not of a certain look, uh, you were lumped in with a lot of guys in WCW. Well, know. and there was the perceived quote unquote heat of Kevin Sullivan being in power, given everything that had oh, happened. Yeah, 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 won. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see why they're unhappy, but it's a major move where at the time when guys would jump, it would usually be one, not, yeah. not four. So it was a pretty major shift. And I wondered, you know, when you're thinking about retirement, and again, we don't know exactly when you pinned it down, do you see these guys coming in and think, you know, here I am hurting and slowing down a little bit. Maybe it is time to, you know, make some space for somebody else. Or is that even a consideration? No, no, I wasn't retired because to make room for anyone else, I was excited to have those guys in the company and they were a sure. huge part of it. And I again, going back, Eddie injured his elbow. Uh, night on, one, right? Night one. So I'll have to go back and see. I, it just seems like that had, uh, it had some type of ramifications in my own career. It just feels in my head like that was part of the reason we decided to do the uh, uh, the no way out as a as a cell match and a retirement match. It had something to do with Eddie's injury, but I wasn't begrudging any of those guys the shot because they were all, uh, you know, great great workers. As far as Shane, I do not recall him reaching out to me after that. I think Shane, remember he'd been Dean Douglas, right? Yeah. This is one of the worst. Gimmicks of all time. Gimmicks of all time. And I remember Shane telling me when he got the character, Vince told me he doesn't think someone as intelligent as I am should have to yell to get their point across. And so they, the Shane Douglas we saw as Dean Douglas was the worst possible interpretation. If Shane had come along during the Attitude Era. Totally different. Story. Oh, totally different. Ben, Shane Douglas, the franchise. We might be talking about Shane as one of the great Attitude Era uh, guys, uh, you know, in that top five to ten. Timing's everything. Guys, timing's everything. Instead, he gets saddled with one of the worst characters. He's got heat with the wrong guys. I don't – he went back to ECW, uh, and I don't think he felt like another WWE run was in the cards. I don't right. want to speak for Shane, but I don't recall getting a, a phone call about a return at that time. Uh, you wrote in your book about a former WWF executive, Jim Burns, yeah. who was trying to claim that the footage from beyond the mat with, the, with your family being at ringside distraught, uh, Mr. Byrne is essentially saying that the foot, the footage was doctored. And I can't imagine that that sat very well with you. With, the, with your family being at ringside distraught, uh, Mr. Byrne is essentially saying that the foot, the footage was doctored. And I can't imagine that that sat very well with you. Yeah, it wasn't doctored. I did know there was going to be a plastic surgeon there. Uh, this is where I was thinking about this. I was like, oh, man, I've always been uncomfortable with the term blade, right? I don't think I've ever used the term blading. And I, even in the first book, I referred to it as a small instrument of implement of de, instrument of destruction. And I said, I know that sounds a little barbaric, but sometimes, you know, we, you draw blood intentionally and that's blading. So this is like, if there's going to be a bombshell, it would be when I had the phone call, I'm with my kids at Disneyland. I know I've got to do the uh, match with the Rock Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, and otherwise, if I didn't have to get on a plane and go to Phoenix, I could have said to the kids, look, we're going to have this bad episode there, but we're going to Disney afterward. We're going to Disney. So, you know, I come back, I'm a mess. I go, kids, don't worry about it. We're going to Disney. But instead, I've got to get on a plane and go to Phoenix. So we do the Disney stuff ahead of time. The night before um, the big match there with The Rock, the I Quit match, I talk to Russo and he tells me the plan has changed. The original plan is supposed to be Rock hits, you know, there's number five is the magic number of chair shots. Camera's going to show my wife and my kids. And that's where the I Quit comes in. Can't bear to have my children watching me. I think to myself, I don't know if this is a good idea. Is I don't think my kids are going to believe I'm hurt. Mm. Because for years, I'd been telling them, Dad's just playing. Yes. You know, no, you can't hurt Dad. You know, you can't just hurt Dad. Boo -boo just a boo-boo. Yeah, there's a thing where I go, just a little boo-boo. And Noel said, Daddy, that looks like a big boo-boo. I said, yeah, it, it is, honey, it is. 
So this is a, this is a first time revelation because even in the uh, the second book, Fully is Good, I said, hey, look, I was already busted open from previous match. That's not true. Um, uh, when I told Vince, I said, Vince, the problem is I'm already you know, lacerated, and I wasn't. Whatever it is I had, I, I don't, I can't remember what it was. Surgical blade or Remington steel, I don't know. Uh, right after that phone call with Russo, man, I, I took that, just about carved a gully in my head. So now, although what I said technically was not true, you at made the time it I said it, I made it true. And that's why if you look at the footage and beyond the mat and you have Francois working on me, he's trying to patch that thing up because it was just a horrific split. It was just in that moment. I was like, I, and so we decide, um, come up with plan B, which is the pre-recorded I quit, I quit, which I thought was a pretty good plan B. Very to this day, people will go, was that actually you saying I quit? And it was like, no, that was me at Sunday Night Heat saying, i uh, doing a little play on Dr. Seuss. I will not say those words. I will not say them here or there. I will not say them anywhere. I will not say those words, you twit. I will not say, I quit, I quit, I quit. And that's what they end up recording. If you look back within one or two weeks, um, Triple H uses, they use that same idea of, uh, taking a beating in front of someone as a finish. It had something to do with Triple H in China. I think he looks over at China. I think Triple H ends up quitting a match so as to avoid China. I have to go back and look at it, but I think they end up using that. So they liked it. They liked it, but it, there was a concern because USA executives were going to be there. It was thought to be barbaric, and it turns out it was far more barbaric the same the way it played out, right? right? Far more than five chair shots, it was 11. So going back to Jim Byrne, what I was angry about was like, there was no doctored footage. The only thing I knew is that there was going to be a surgeon there. They found out, I didn't say I need a plastic surgeon. I said, I, I'm going to need somebody to stitch this thing up after the match. And they found a plastic surgeon to do a nice job on a head wound. Uh, so if people go back and look at uh, that split now, you, know, you can see in the footage, you know, I'm handcuffed, right? Yeah. So the moment Rock hits that thing, it just opens up, and it was it was powerful because there wasn't a person out there who can go, oh, I saw him go. No, yeah, no, there's no is, magic for that. This is the chair opening up something that I had previously, um, my my previous handiwork. Um, and that would explain why I would, I did go to Disneyland the day of the show and I go, that would explain why I had pantyhose wrapped around my head and a band, you know, bandana and all that stuff because I had this massive wound and, uh, I was like, I don't think it's going to stop. They actually wanted me to wrestle, um, Mabel that night. Um, big daddy, big daddy V viscera. Yeah. And I was like, ah, first of all, I think the idea of going out and losing a match before, before the main event of a pay-per-view is a bad idea. Awful. Second, I think just going out and having any match before they see you is a bad idea, which is why I do the meet and greets after the show. Right. When I do these shows, because you just know that people are going to be most excited the first time they Correct. see you, right? Going back to when WWE used to do four episodes or five episodes of Superstar or Superstars or WCW used to do two or three tapings. By the third time they've seen you, people are noticeably less excited than they were that first time. So for a number of reasons, uh, do I want to lose? No. But do I want to wrestle Viscera at all? No. I don't think that's going to get people hyped up. And yeah. plus I said, this thing's ready to go, man. I, I I can't be bleeding buckets on a Sunday night heat match with Viscera if I'm going to take on The Rock. So I will unca – well, again, I guess I'm not uncategorical. I'm not, I'm not categorically denying it. I'm saying – we had a plastic surgeon because it was known that I was uh, had this head wound issue, but the head wound was self <laughs> self inflicted in a hotel room. I wasn't expecting that type of blood loss, you know. So here I am. I think we were in a nice hotel because when I had the family with me, we'd been in a nice hotel. And all of a sudden, it's like, this is more than I counted on. This is worse than I wanted to Your do. Your family's it. in the room with you when it happened. They were sleeping, I believe sleeping so i've got to stop that would have been a panic got to stop sure. the blood loss uh there was another time 
Um, this is going back. Uh, and I want to maybe in, incorporate the this into future shows because I have so much fun when I do the shows when I talk about the January 10th match with Terry Funk because just doing the Terry voice, it makes me happy. Yeah. And if fans are watching and they see that I love doing it, they're going to be more prone to loving it. Um, but the issue I had is that, man, I was so banged up after that, you know, that barbed wire match with Terry. Uh, maybe not as banged up as I was eight months later at the King of the Death match tournament. But I was like, okay, I'm in the bathroom. I'm, I've got more gauze on me than Boris Karloff in the original Universal Mummy movie. I look ridiculous. And so I'm in the bathroom at the airport in Tokyo. <laughs> let me take this bandage off. And I take the bandage off. And I this all but spurts out. At the, oh, wow. <laughs> I got this gusher going on. Tracy Smothers was there. He's trying to he's trying to put stuff on there. And I've got to go catch my plane. And I got blood pouring down my face. He's putting the pressure on Those there. Those four other passengers. Uh, oh man, man! I think yeah. I did get cleaned up, on, you know, pretty good. But that woman who had to, the woman who eventually had to sit next to me <laughs> on the way home <laughs> from uh, the King of the Death Match tournament, she's looking, and my arm's starting to turn color because I've been burned. I can't take a shower because I've got forty-two stitches and oh. seven different body parts. They don't want you to take a shower. I've got all this matted. You probably blood. smell like C4. I, I smell like, yeah, it's burnt hair, charred flesh. I smell awful. And she gets up to take a powder from, uh, they, I got called up at the airport. They said, um, Foley, Michael, and they give me a business class ticket. This is, uh, it never happened before or since. It's actually my first, uh, uh, this, no, no, this was my probably eighth or ninth tour for IWA Japan. Never flew business, always in coach. And they're, hand, so they're handing me a business class ticket. So I sit down and the poor woman next to me is all, all but convulses. She gets up, I believe, to use the restroom. And after about 30 minutes, she hasn't returned. I look to the back and this is Conrad where I love the idea that I can, this is my interpretation of reality. Was she in a fetal position, <laughs> their hands folded in prayer? Probably not, but she was definitely in a coach class seat. She would rather sit coach. I, I sit coach and sit next to me. Which is a very expensive uh, fare if you've never priced it. It's a that. big difference, right? Thousands of Thousands dollars. of dollars extra. And I was like, she would rather sit and coach than sit with me. And I took that as the highest form of flattery. You could stretch out even more. Uh, oh, man, it was great. <laughs> And to have that power to repel women. So I'd been married for a while at that time. I was like, okay, I don't think I have it anymore. And 95, oh, yeah, yeah, five years into the marriage, I could still repulse the average woman. It's uh, it's the opening scene of Howard Stern's Private Parts movie where the lady seated on the airplane. That's right, like, yeah. Well, who is this? And Well, he's not bloody, but you get through. But is there still that part of him that is that, unloved kid right in roosevelt high school who mm -hmm. didn't fit in never felt he was cool and even though he makes it big on that plane he sees that woman looking at him and he's still the kid who wasn't good enough you know yeah. it's been said you know i think it was raven the, who was the first person to say like there's something wrong with all of us none of, of us dress up in tights and you know, uh, uh, engage in this crazy fantasy warfare, which can be very real at times in order to win the, uh, win the love of total strangers, unless you're lacking somewhere in your childhood. So well, th there's a performer bug, you know, whether yeah, it's yeah, stand up yeah. comedians or wrestling or yeah, there's something that, we're trying to well, prove. Well, look, there's this, uh, not to go to the friends well too often, but Bruce Willis had one of these great uh, guest roles on Friends in which he's this stoic guy. He is the father of the student who Ross is dating. He doesn't like it. Comes in, asserts his will, starts dating the Jennifer Aniston character of Rachel on Friends. And she's trying to get him to open up. And he, no, nope, nothing there, nothing there. And then he finally confides in her that his family was too poor to get a big wheel. Mm. And they got him something uh, that was like a chicken mobile. And now the guy breaks down. He goes, 
he used to call me the chicken man. And now she can't get him to stop crying right. because she's opened up, you know, that, that wound. So it's kind of the same thing with the guy, the, the men out there, you know, men and women who are looking for something they didn't have. Yeah, we, we want to perform, but we're also looking looking for that support. So now my friend D Snyder, D and I have been tight for a long time. He he says the same thing. Like you do, he said, I think he wrote in his book. He did a really good job, wrote his own book. And he talked about being a lead singer or being a musician in general. He's like, you don't get the microphone, stand up in front of a room of strangers and say like, I'm worth listening to uh, because you're going to get the crap beaten out of you sure. emotionally. We're talking about. Sure. So last, this is interesting. And uh, stop me if you think I go off on too many oh. tangents. But last night after I did the meet and greet, the manager was really happy. He's a former, he's still a stand-up comic. Great and he guy. said, so yeah, great guy. And he, uh, and I'm relaying to him, uh, oh, a subject of Bobcat Gothwaite comes up. And I said, tell Bobcat Gothwaite, he's going to be there next month. Tell him I loved World's Greatest Father with Robin Williams. It's a very dark comedy, but man, it's a great, it's just a great role. And it's really hit me hard. You know, one of the great, uh, speeches to me in cinematic history where Robin Williams is talking about his son who's taken on this cult-like fame in the aftermath of a suicide uh, by sexual asphyxiation, <laughs> which Robin Williams has doctored to make it look like his son was you know, too long for the world, too sensitive. He writes the suicide note and this kid takes on a uh, popularity he never had in uh in life. in life and so now the people got shirts and the kid is super over and robin williams is giving like the speech at the big you know uh, memorial he goes my son and he realized he's gone too far with this he goes my son was a douchebag <laughs> he opens up about what an awful human being his son was but he says but i but i loved him and and so in, so he's trying to say he's not who you think he was. Yeah. But everybody, despite their frailties and their faults, deserves to be loved. And yes. it's just really powerful. Yeah, I'm getting these, the, you know, the things are on the scalp, you know, when you get the emotional. So that's happening to me now. Um, so so I said, why do you think it is? Uh, I said, he's he was so manic and crazy on stage, Bobcat Goldthwait as a comedian. Uh, and for people who never saw his stuff, just think of him. Bobcat Goldthwait was the guy that Bill Murray fired in Scrooge. Yes. So he's essentially doing his stand up in that character. And it was one of those you either like him or you didn't. I did like him. I did too. But I thought it was really uh, noteworthy that when it comes to writing, being a writer and a director, he would gravitate to much darker, more serious material. And so now I'm, I'm I'm telling the guy about a discussion I had on the Opie and Anthony show. Those guys were super over at one time. Oh yeah, you know it's a shame. You know, uh, you know it ended with a racial thing, and Anthony got fired. Uh, you know, for going on a tirade on social media. But one time, those guys were really, really exactly. over. Yeah. And I thought to me, they would hand you the ball and let you run with it. You know, they weren't afraid of letting the stars the guy shine on there. So I'd been in the studio a bunch of times. They really liked having me there. I was used to seeing big stars come in and interacting with them, but Cheech and Chong come in and I don't know what to say. I feel like I'm out of my element. And Cheech finally, or maybe it was Tom, one of them goes, hey, what, who, who's this guy? Why doesn't he have anything to say? So Opie goes, this is Mick Foley. He's one of the great wrestlers. Gets Chong talking about his days growing up watching Stampede Wrestling, which is really cool. Yeah. But they said, why don't you, don't you have anything to say? So I said to Cheech, I said, why is it you think so many great comics become great dramatic actors? He was like, oh, that is a good question. He said, because in order to have that, you know, degree of, you know, whether you know, you're a manic comic or you're just finding the humor and things, like there's got to be a yin to that yang or a yang to that yin. Like you have to almost have to have a little darker side in order to really embrace that comical side. So last night when I was talking to the, to the manager, he said, comics can become good act dramatic actors but dramatic actors very rarely become good comics he said because 
being a comic requires timing and getting the knack for timing requires getting the crap beaten out of you emotionally along the way. And so someone can get the crap beaten out of emotionally, work on being that great guy on stage and then embrace that darker part. But it's really hard to get a good actor to go back and be willing to take that pounding emotionally in front of a live crowd as they learn the craft. And I thought, that's really interesting and really yeah. telling. But you look at a lot of the uh, great comics who become actors and they go, of course, Tom Hanks would do Bosom Buddies and, the, you know, the, he did a couple of like wacky comedies. But you'd be hard pressed to find people who remember that Tom Hanks was a great Stand up sure. comic because he's been such a great dramatic actor. Steve Martin, you know, he did the jerk coming out of the gate, which I think was a great, great movie. And he's reverted back and he's done Sergeant Bilko and a couple of crazy things. But by and large, he's known as a great dramatic actor. Yeah. And Robin Williams was the same way. You know, he had this manic energy and he was able to harness that and do these great roles, you know, as world's greatest dad or his role in, um, Oh, I'm trying to think of one with uh, Robert De Niro. Awakenings was really good. Kurt Angle told me about traveling with Robin Williams um, overseas to do shows for the troops. Mm. And he was like, I had to pretend to be asleep because he always felt like he needed to be on. Yes. And I think he'd still be alive if he learned that he didn't need to be on. He didn't need to please everybody at all times. He didn't need to be the life of the party on the plane to Iraq. That's the crazy pressure. Yeah, crazy pressure. But Kurt also said it was really interesting to see him form the show. He would go out and he would have X number of minutes he would do. And then based on things that they saw and did, he would now write new material for that day and it would grow. So uh, I know we're a long way from where we were. I don't even know where our <laughs> jumping off point was. We're probably regretting the decision to do this stuff with me. Oh, right no, now. not at all. I, but I I'm a rambler, right? No, this is great stuff, man. People want the Foley experience. And they're, and they're getting, getting it, right? Day, baby. All right, boys and girls, you know what time it is. It's time for me to tell you about chili sleep, and I was just telling Mick about it. And, and here's the thing about this, Mick. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering our core body temperature. And you've lived in the South. you got to have a ceiling fan in your bedroom. It's like we're required by law down here. Yes. Uh, well, here's the reason. Temperature-controlled sleep is going to repair your muscles after a hard day's work. It's going to improve your cognitive function, so you can always start your day feeling sharp and alert. And that's been my experience. I have a chilly sleep. I've got the Uller system. I've had it for over a year now. It's changed my life. What I've got now is a customizable, climate-controlled sleep solution that improves my entire well-being. Now, they make the Uller. You can also check out the Cube sleep system. Either way, we're talking hydro-powered mattress toppers right it's temperature controlled it fits over your existing mattress to provide you your ideal sleep temperature let me explain mick my wife likes to sleep a little warmer so her side she wants to be at like 75. i like to sleep a little cooler i want to be at like 67. i get a perfect night's sleep at that but before i had chilly sleep mick i'm cranking down the ac i'm flipping the pillow now i'm paying to heat my laundry room i, I don't need my laundry room to be cooler i need my bed to be cooler Chili Sleep has made that happen. This is perfect for you to get that deep sleep, whether you sleep hot or cold. Chili Sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Real quick, listen to this now. Imagine waking up and not feeling tired. Chili Sleep can make that happen. They've made it happen for me. Prior to Chili Sleep, Mick, I was sleeping like five, six hours a night. With Chili Sleep, I'm seven, eight, nine. I even slept 10 hours once with Chili Sleep. It's unbelievable to wake up and not feel tired. Sounds incredible because I'm the same way. My wife likes it hotter. Mm -hmm. I like it cooler. Mm -hmm. I lose out. Of course. I lose that argument. I'm a guy. It's what we do. Yep. And uh, a guy in a successful marriage has to learn to admit he's wrong, even when he knows in his heart he's not every Cor once in a while. Correct. Has to learn to uh, make the uh, thermostat the wife's realm. But now we get our say. Well, yeah, man. And, and here's the thing, too. You don't want to wake up all hot and sweaty. You're not going to get a good night's sleep. You're going to get up and pee. You're going to be fighting with the covers. N none of that anymore. Do what I did. Head over to chillysleep.com forward slash Mick to learn more and save 30% off the purchase of any new Cube or Uller sleep system. Now, this offer is available exclusively for Mick Foley listeners and only for a limited time. That's Chili, C-H-I-N. 
lisleep.com slash Mick to take advantage of our exclusive discount and wake up feeling refreshed every day. I'm curious about beyond the mat. I mean, you're going to make appearances to promote the movie on good morning America, but famously Vince had cold feet about promoting Vince that. hated the fact that I went on and, uh, promoted beyond the mat. He hated the movie. Um, originally they were involved. That's how they got access to the footage. They got, yeah. Maybe they got wind of what it was going to look like, or they got a rough cut and that all stopped very quickly. Vince, a real believer in the magic. Um, I'll argue that the uh, the video that WWE put out, um, I think it was in 2004 when Brock and Kurt had their match in Seattle and when Brock uh, landed on his head on the yep. Shooting Star Press, with the dual storylines. Oh, three. Oh, three, okay. So, yeah, it was just uh, four years after Beyond the Mat. Uh, the dual storylines were uh, Brock and Kurt, Rock and Steve. And I thought that was... That was unveiling the magic, and I thought that was in its own way darker than Beyond the Mat. So it's his prerogative, this is his company. If, 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 and especially if that's the way the story goes, it becomes that you can't, you could, I guess, conceivably through editing, make a dark story happy. But that was a sad story. Steve almost, you know, I don't want to say almost died, but he was in the emergency room the night before because he felt so much pressure. And at that time, uh, I can't remember the substance that was in the energy drinks, but you get GNC. It wasn't like it was anything illegal. Yeah. But like a lot of us in wrestling, you know, we don't draw people who do moderation well. Right. Because uh, I joke around about the instantaneous Foley risk-reward ratio analysis. But if any of us actually had a risk-reward ratio analysis about the wisdom of getting in a business that's almost guaranteed to break you physically yeah. and is 100% guaranteed to break you down emotionally. Uh, and knowing that the chances of making it big are ultra slim. And even after you make it big, who, who would sign up? Who would sign up, right? But we're all chasing this dream. Ephedrine. Ephedrine was the stuff. There you go. So instead of Steve having one energy drink, he probably may have overdone it. And he was an all day coffee guy anyway, like a lot of people in WWE are. And man, his, his heart didn't react well to it. He didn't know what the heck was going on. He thought he was having a heart attack. And to me, that's a that's a heavy storyline. Uh, I thought, um, is it as heavy as what Jake went through in uh, Beyond the Mat? Uh, no, or maybe not. But I thought it was heavy in its own way. But Vince thought it was taking the magic away. He thought it was a good movie. He told Barry Blaustein, it's a good movie. It's not the movie that I would have made. He was uncomfortable with a lot of the stuff. Do you think the difference is he owned the rock footage and he put it out and he released it and he was in control versus the Vin, other Yeah, Vince doesn't else. like to uh, relinquish control. I mean, those some of the issues I had with him. Uh, you know, you sign over a lot of your rights when you sign that contract. But of all things, a novel was what sidelined our, you know, our relationship for a year and a half because that I had the freedom to do that. With anyone and i just didn't want a wwe label on it i essentially wanted to make my own solo album you know like sure. and they should have just understood i'm a wwe guy let mick do, go and write his thing it turns out it wasn't a big success anyway i mean i'm really proud of the I two bought it. thank you thank you conrad and i think it was really good storytelling yeah but that's where a lot, there was a lot of darkness especially in the sure. first book and uh you know people who were like i remember someone saying at a book signing, where did this darkness come? I've never seen it. I said, you never saw my ECW promos because there was some darkness there um, too. But Vince, yeah, he was not a fan of Beyond the Mat. I think it had something to do with him. I think he was dealing with a, you know, what he thought was a poor hand in that he was losing the rating war. He didn't want WCW to be the focus of what could be, uh, you know, what I uh, think it's, you know, one of the best, if not the best wrestling documentary. Uh, so he relinquished creative control. I don't think he liked that. Yeah. And I don't think he liked his guy. And by the time the movie came out, he was on top in the room. Yeah. So he didn't feel like and he also by it. the time the movie came out, I was no longer the guy. When Barry originally got in touch with me, I get a knock on the door of our, you know, off, off the strip motel in Vegas where Sabu and I are going to wrestle at like the Copper Nugget. I think I paid for the Copper Nugget. 
<laughs> and it was Barry Bloom, who I only knew a little bit as Jesse Ventura's manager, who has since been gone on to represent me for the last 22 years, as you well know, right? Sure. Uh, and he was like, he wasn't a friend of mine at all. I was surprised to get a call. I've got a guy, Barry Blaustein. And Barry, he comes up. And so my role, more or less, in this thing, and I'm playing myself, but I'm the guy who had a taste of stardom. More than the taste. I had a pretty good dose of stardom there in WCW. But I was back on the independent scene. That was going to be my role. And uh, luckily for me, by the time... We uh we started really rolling on this. No, there was some footage back then when I when the kids I go over to the kids my dad's house and he won't let us there you go, go down in the basement because you know you're always going to be your father's son no matter how big a star you are. Sure. Um, uh, that I think by the time it came out and it showed that match at the uh, uh the rumble, be, yeah, uh, beyond the rumble and then uh, the um the I quit match with the rock mm -hmm. um, that Vince didn't want people to see behind the curtain. He didn't want people to see that there's fallout for what you do. He didn't want to see that families have trouble. And I have speculated. I remember Vince and I talking for the first time in quite a while. And I had been a, um, this is uh, January, 2016. So I said, Vince, I said, it's never, I've never had this verified, but I've always felt like part of the reason I am so rarely on TV is because it's really, I'm obviously having a lot of trouble getting around. This is before I had my hip replaced and my knee replaced, which was a game changer for me. It was, I said, I think it's just really hard for people to watch me and being as heavy as I was and I'm back to being difference being I've had my hip and knee replaced so I'm not in agony I don't like to exaggerate but I was in agony for years on years on end with uh, the pain caused largely by dropping elbows off the oh, ring apron. I mean, yeah that's not a good structural move um at all so if you're out there and you're thinking of making it your move don't make it your move and, and, and wear knee pads yeah wear knee pads <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a price to be paid for all this stuff and man I was a lot of times where like I know it was going to be this severe. I don't know if I would have paid it, you know. Just So what did he say when he said, is it because? Uh, he didn't say no. He didn't say yes. I said, I want you to know that I have lost 25 pounds with the goal of being down 80 pounds by Christmas. And he said, Mick, I'm going to hold you to that. And once he said that, now I had something. I had a goal. I had a goal. And again, I'm going to break some news here. I'm not going back on WWE television until I'm under 300 because I feel like I've let Vince down. Even if he gets on the phone with me personally, he goes, Mick, we'd like to have you back. Because I've said no on a couple of occasions. I did come back for uh, Undertaker, um, but I've put on a ton of weight since then too because, man, I got to tell you, Conrad, I took my responsibility to keep my local eateries in business <laughs> during the pandemic seriously. I was alone a lot of time because we were trying to sell our house in Long Island after we'd uh, already moved to Florida. And every time I would do something, uh, work with WWE on uh, Lost Treasures, uh, my wife, who had a pre-existing condition, would insist that I'd be on the shelf for like two weeks. So I wow. spent a lot of time alone. And that delivery was my that's the biggest part of my day. Sure. And when I was losing the weight... Um, I, I grew to understood, understand, okay, you feel the fullness coming on, and that's when you stop eating. But during the pandemic, it's like, yes, I feel that fullness coming on, and I'm going to continue eating <laughs> because I want to be the guy who you know just zones out. I've seen in a book where uh, potato chips are sometimes called the poor man's uh, Xanax. Oh, wow. Because of the uh, carbohydrate surge that causes you to more or less zone out after you've eaten a big bag. I'm not talking about the little, yeah. the, the fun bag. I'm talking about full bag of potato chips. I don't want guys out there going, wow, I'd like to experiment with the poor, experiment with the poor man's Xanax. Do it, experiment with it just to see how <laughs> zoned out you feel, whether you enjoy that lull in energy. Um, but that was, uh, yeah, that was part of the reason I, you know, fell into those same bad habits. But yeah. with Vince behind me, you know, I'm going to hold you to that. And when I weighed in uh, at two, so the idea was to get down to 257, because I believe I was 337 
Um, I got down two months early, weighed in for Vince. And Stephanie must have told me three different times that day, my father is so proud of you. And then I lost another 20 just because it was like, all right, as long as you lost 80, you might as well lose 100. Right. And uh, yeah, so I put back every bit of that. And uh, eventually, <laughs> eventually I'll get back on that train. But Oh, you're working uh, it. I saw you eating salad last night. I did have a salad, man. Yeah. I did. But I, you know, here's part of the issue I have is that fans will accept me at 337. Yeah. They don't care. That's the, I think for some of them, when they saw me at 237, it was like, who the F is, is this okay? guy? Is yeah. he all right? He looks almost sickly. And it was like, you know, your face gets dry. You know, you lose yeah. weight in the face, which is, you know, a lot of guys look great that way. But if you grew up and liking this heavy set McFoley and it's part of what you remember, uh, while people were happy that I lost the weight, I'm not sure that they thought it was altogether a good thing. What was King Kong Bundy's take on that? That uh, being a body guy was a sucker because uh, when you're young, if you're fat and look like shit, then when you get old and you're fat and look like shit, you're still perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, the, so the Radicals debut on Raw on January 31st in Pittsburgh. And it's a nice shot in the arm from a talent standpoint. You know, you got Benoit, Malenko, Eddie, and uh, Perry Saturn. They're brought in as storyline friends of yours. And you even talk about how much better the TV time would be uh, to give them than maybe the, the likes of Mean Street Posse. And in hindsight, I think we all look back at that Radicals job and say, mm, that's maybe a little less than from a debut standpoint. What do you, what do you think of the way they... Because they all lost right away. Yeah, well. that was crazy that they oh, yeah. lost. I don't know what they were thinking. I, yeah. Look, uh, you know, I, I don't know how your how, how do your listeners feel about uh, the Observer and Dave Meltzer. I mean, I, I love Dave. I've read Dave's stuff for nearly twenty years. Yeah, so. I, I haven't read the Observer, oh, man, in over ten years. Going back to when I realized when I would come back off the road in WWE at that time when I started it was ten days on, three days off. And I would come home and I'd beat and beat and then I would read the newsletter. And at first, you know, that people weren't really taking to the mankind character. And that stuff hurt my feelings. And I'm like, wow, as a dad, now I'm being less of a dad than I can be because, and being less of a husband because this stuff is hurting my feelings. And then I finally, uh, I just, oh, I don't, I'm not going to read it anymore. I'm yeah. not going to let it dictate my life. But, uh, I, you know, Dave's got a lot of detractors, and I'm like, man, I think Dave publishes like 30,000 words a week. One of the which, hardest working guys around incre- the industry. It's incredible. I mean, for anyone who's... Never misses a week. Never misses a week. He's always on, and I think personally he responds to way too many people on Twitter, you know, he does. D- detractors. I think all of us have that. The mute button is a joyous thing. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. And I've, I've benefited... I'll even reach out to a guy like I'm not close with Kenny Omega, but I like Kenny and I consider him a friend only not close. because I've only met him a handful of times, but I went, when I would see Kenny respond to this stuff, I just DM him my like, Kenny. You don't need to do that. Just forget about those people, you know, just don't let them dictate your life. Uh, but anyway, the reason I bring up Dave is he had this great analogy back when WCW uh, purchased uh UWF, and you've got this great opportunity to have this head on head rivalry. And it's like, well, you know, Chevy doesn't have to defeat Buick. They both are under the same umbrella. I think he he had an analogy about a toaster and bragging about the best toaster. And it's like, but you're the same company. You you make the you make the two toasters. One of them doesn't have to be worse than the other. Because inevitably, all the WCW guys beat down the UWF guys, and there were a handful of guys, Sting, Steiners, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, uh, who ended up staying on with WCW. By and large, they established that they were the superior brand. Why those guys didn't come out of the gate with wins across the board, I don't know. Eddie, again, he got injured, uh, dislocated his elbow. I don't know if Eddie was supposed to win, but it put those guys in a hole right away. Uh, and now, uh, you know, Eddie went on to be one of the most beloved characters, sure. you know. Uh, De- Dean, uh, ultra respected and uh, behind the scenes. He was never going to take off like a rocket because, uh, you know, his personality was very dry. And but one of the best he, technicians One of the ever. best technicians ever. Benoit, I, you know, you know, 
It is what it, it is. is. what it is, but you can't take away that he was one of the greats. Sure. Um, and uh, that WrestleMania that ends with the confetti falling and Benoit and Eddie in the ring is just a powerful way. And it's also something nobody nobody would have seen red in the stars no. for WWE closing a show with these two guys as your champions. So I'll say they went on to be, uh, and Perry got kind of lo got lost by the wayside, you know. Um, yeah, he's, uh, I don't know. Um, it, it never, uh, Perry could be really tough on guys in the ring. It just know? didn't click with WWE. It, just, it didn't click with WWE. Um, but I do remember thinking, that's a strange way to debut people. The original storyline of, of the whole McMahon-Helmsley leadership, you know, on air, refusing to give the Radicals a job, leads to Raw ending with you and the Radicals beating up Hunter. So that's a pretty cool way yeah, yeah. to debut them. Again, I, I think that the decision to have a follow-up match had something to do with Eddie's injury. So I'm maybe not, there was going to be a, I don't know, an eight-man or a ten-man. Maybe, that was, like that. Yeah, maybe that was the case. Yeah, maybe that was the case. Yeah, I don't think the idea was to bury the Radicals. I don't know what the rationale was behind having them all lose. Again, that doesn't seem like the best way out of the gate. But I have to believe there was a plan for them to come back. Uh, maybe they sense that there'd be resentment among the WWE fans if they came in and beat their guys right away. Which is really silly when you think about it, because the only time in history, you know, even when the whole UWF uh, thing happened with Jim Crockett, Dusty had all those guys lose. And then we know when WCW went down, all those guys lost. And yeah. WWE won. The only time it went the other way is with the NWO. When Scott Hall and Kevin Nash came in and beat everybody. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. But nobody ever repeated that ever. But they work here. So what does it matter? But you would hope if there's ever going to be uh, the the wrestling war, which would be AEW, WWE, that if they could ever, if that ever is in the cards, you know, wrestling fans dream that uh, they would be treated, they would be an agreement reached that would be best for everybody, even when I was a GM of Raw, I think Raw won all six Survivor Series matches. Yeah, because Raw is is the, the A show, the A show, and yeah. it was like whoa, whoa, you know, uh, there was a, there was heat on me, which I didn't appreciate at all. In that, where people would tie me together with what they didn't like about the show, and then tag me in those things. I was like, wait a second, so yeah, you That's guys it. believe <laughs> not that really the I general run manager. the show like. <laughs> Like, uh, that's like uh, tagging in Julia Louis-Dreyfus because you're not happy with the direction of the country. It's like she portrays the Veep, the Veep you know, yeah. or a bit later the president. Like, you guys, uh, just use your head here. Like, it's a billion-dollar company. I'm going to put that guy with the fanny pack and the flannel shirt and a history of head injuries. I'm going to put him in charge of it. Only with knee pads. Yeah. Uh, so at SmackDown on February 1st, the show opens with you and the radicals coming out. You're going to cut a promo about how they weren't old enough to make it in WCW and they deserve a chance. Uh, Hunter is going to announce. I, get, I got my zingers in there. Oh, you right? did? Yeah. Man. I was, I was a hundred percent on board as a WWE guy. I think the uh, original plan, it feels like it's set here where it's going to be a series of matches and if they win, they get jobs. So it's going to be an eight man tag with the radicals against Hunter and the rest of DX. And that's supposed to be the main event. We know that doesn't happen. Um, but boy, what a crazy time this is because right after this, uh, and, and it's hard to just even put this into context, all that Vince is doing with the WWF and, and we know the next year they're actually going to go public, but here on February 3rd, he announces the XFL and, yeah. uh, you wrote in your book, Vince called me on my cellular phone on February 6th. I had my kids in the car and wasn't in any mood for a verbal confrontation. So I never mentioned 2020. What do you think we should do about the pay-per-view? Vince said, I consider my relationship with Vince to be a good one and at times to be a close one, but he doesn't make a habit of consulting with me about <laughs> pay-per-view ideas over the phone. I generally give the world wrestling federation some good ideas and they give me a great deal of creative freedom concerning interviews and angles. But this particular call was a little out of the norm. Fortunately, I had been giving my potential retirement match a great deal of thought and had an idea on tap. I had regretted not retiring after the Madison square garden show and feared hanging around much longer. By the time the phone call was done, we had booked our no way out main event. It was cactus Jack and triple H and a hell in a cell match. 
with the loser being forced to retire. I had intended to go out at, at the WrestleMania with a nice send off, but I actually liked this idea better wrestling my kind of match in a pay-per-view main event. Man, I'm glad. First of all, that's some pretty good writing. You know, yeah, that, absolutely. That kid can write. And I was thinking, wow, I would not declare my relationship with Vince to be close at this point, although it could be, could be, you never say never. Um, but yeah, I knew that the injury to Eddie had something to do with it. So uh, possibly they were going to go with the radicals and, uh, and, and triple H. So maybe the triple H Royal rumble match was supposed to be a one-off triple, triple H and cactus Jack. And that I was hoping to retire at mania, but uh, yeah, now I do agree with them. Thanks for clearing that up. If you had your druthers thinking back on it, I mean, I know it's easy to look back with hindsight. But in your mentality, leaving the Rumble in January of 2000, who would have been your dream WrestleMania retirement opponent? Would it have been Hunter or would it have been someone else? Yeah, I I feel so fortunate to have had those two big matches with Hunter. Because there's this telling moment beyond the mat where I say, I don't want to be remembered as the guy with the sock. Right. And then after I, I, Barry Blaustein shows me the footage, he was concerned that I was going to come across poorly as a father, you know, because I did in my own defense, by the time I got backstage, the kids had calmed down. I didn't realize that they had been uh, beside themselves and hysterical, you know, even where my son asked me, dad, can I go back out and watch the rumble? And my daughter says, dad, I want daddy, I want to wrestle you. And I said, well, we'll wrestle when I get home. I want to wrestle you right now. (laughs) I'll bandage up. She wants to wrestle me right now. So they seem fine. And Barry wanted me to see that and remark on it because he liked me. You know, he didn't want me to come across poorly as a father. He thought that would be unfair. And so that's why he showed me that footage. Um, uh, So I did get, but I, and then I said, maybe I will, would rather go out as the guy with the sock. Um, but I did get to go out the way I wanted to go out with two big matches. So I can't say that there would be a dream opponent for me. Yeah. Uh, I can't say, I can't say that. And I did end up, uh, you know, catching on against my will, uh, in the WrestleMania main event, you know, uh, people can call me a hypocrite for coming back six weeks after I said, I wouldn't prostitute my name by coming back. In two months. I think I came back and said, I didn't come back in two months. I came back in six weeks. <laughs> uh, but I'm also the only guy to ever actually try to change the company's mind when they're told they're going to be in a WrestleMania main event. So I tried. You can ask JR when you grill JR. I did try. You know, hey, we got a little. I don't do a good JR. I do a good Vince, good Terry Funk, decent. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky Balboa. I don't do a good uh, JR. But when he called me up, he says, well, we got a little role for you, WrestleMania. I don't want to host a panel and main event. I said, I just retired. And, uh, well, Vince feels really strongly about this. Uh, After going back to 99, uh, this was uh, the anniversary of this match just happened. The uh, uh, Valentine's Day Day Massacre with me and The Rock. it had been decided that the three main way match was going to be a singles match instead of being me rock and Steve, it was just going to be rock and Steve because Shawn Michaels, who at that point was still bad. Shawn Michaels, you know, he hadn't undergone his transformation. He was adamant that the main event to main the mania could not be, it had to be a singles match because it had never been anything. Never been anything else. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, he was not by any means trying to cost me my role in that match, but uh, he convinced Vince that it had to be a singles match and I was out. So we came to the Rocky two ending, uh, at the end of Valentine's day massacre where we both get knocked out. Let me go back to the Shawn Michaels thing. Okay. Where you, when you find that, when you discover what happened and that it was Shawn who had Vince's ear, uh, you probably think about not just the goal of of checking that box of main eventing WrestleMania, but it has to impact you financially. Are you pretty upset with Shawn? No, I wa- no, I wasn't upset with Shawn because uh, I wasn't. I'm trying to give you a reason why I wasn't. Because it sounds as you discuss it like I should have been. Um. I didn't, uh, I per, probably I believe that was a better main event anyway. 
you know, Steve and Rock, like that was always, I believe, the money match. Uh, not that the match with me and it wouldn't have, uh, it would have, it would have drawn. I don't know if it was. Did you ever feel like you belonged to the wrestling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, nah, I was a, I was an in your house guy. I was. <laughs> I was well, Sean, you belonged in a WrestleMania main event. Uh, yeah, yeah. I felt I, I wasn't Mister WrestleMania. I was Mister in your house. Uh, there are worse. Yeah, things. there were worse things to be. Yeah, all my best matches came on the uh, secondary. That was the number one name in secondary pay per view main events. That's a t shirt. Uh, <laughs> <for sure. laughs> can I? Can I? Uh, can I copyright Mr. In Your House? I mean, I don't know why you would. <laughs> We've got a guy who can do that. Uh, on the fifth, you're in Mobile, and you tell this great story about a teacher and road dog in your book, Foley is Good. Yeah. Uh, so go out of your way to find it. Um, but you're back on the road for the first time in a little while, yeah, making yeah. towns after you had a little bit of a break. Yeah. I said, I told them, I can do these two big main events, but I can't do it if I'm on the road all the time. Yeah. I have to be able to, try, I have to, be able to do the cardio. And I can't get out there in the character of Cactus Jack and leave anything, you know, in the ring. Like by virtue of that character being what it was, Cactus Jack has to over deliver. Mm -hmm. So now we've committed to being Cactus Jack. He can't be out there every night, turning, burning down the house, tearing down the house because because of my physical limitations. For me to tear down the house, I had to sacrifice. Yeah. I talked last night about what great pride I took in uh, you know, the matches I had with Sean, the house show matches when he was hurt, and how we were able to tear down the house even though I wasn't giving him a single bump. And that's what indirectly led to, you know, Vince finding out that the, you know, the real dude love slash Mick Foley backstory was more interesting than the man, the, the fictional mankind backstory. Um, but I was able to tear down the house with Sean because Sean's, you know, I'll argue, I'll say, this is what I say. Sean is the greatest wrestler of the pay-per-view generation, this generation, which I describe as the generation of monthly pay-per-views. Yeah. So I don't know if you can say greatest wrestler ever about anybody, but greatest wrestler of their generation, given what they did. Like some people look at Bruno and go, well, Bruno didn't do enough. It's like, Bruno did what he had to do to sell out the garden. You know? There was nothing else to if, do. If Bruno, he did all been, there was. yeah, if he'd been doing moon salts, I don't think he's going to be on your wall. You know, he's yeah. not the Italian strongman doing the moon salts. He worked a very believable style that you needed to draw those fans in the northeastern cities every month. Uh, every month, and he did it as as well as anybody. Um, so Sean, that's that's the way I say, it, with a caveat that he is the greatest wrestler of our current generation sure or now we'll look at it as the past generation you know the generation now there is no traditional yeah, yeah. right yeah. it's a new generation now um but i was able to tear down the house with sean as mankind but to be the baby face cactus jack i felt like tear down the house i have to sacrifice and i can't be a hundred percent of the pay-per-view if i'm sacrificing every night every night so uh yeah there was the instance where um i just stayed in navarre florida my old hometown and I was not I was only there for two nights, so I did not get in touch with uh, Kim Bailey, who, uh, oddly enough, was my current daughter. It was, you know, she was the current kindergarten teacher of Noel, and had been Dewey's kindergarten teacher, uh, but also had been the road dogs, and if not kindergarten, then one of his elementary school teachers. Wow! And she was on hand at the crowd in Pensacola. He got in her face. She slapped him. Like, what are the odds of that? Yeah. We've got the kindergarten teacher of Road Dog and the Foley children yeah. in the crowd. And they, they, that wasn't scripted at all. She just played. He probably gave her Iggy, slap me, slap me, slap me, you know, but it was like a great pop. And we were able to get through that night with some smoke and mirrors. But uh, I didn't, I thought I needed the, the break uh, to be as good as I could be. You're doing Raw on the 7th in Dallas, and it's one of the more memorable moments, uh, or at least one of the more memorable Raw main events of oh, all time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, before we get there, the show opens with the Radicals turning heel on you and attacking you before joining up with Hunter, all in order to get jobs in the WWF. So I guess the Eddie injury really had them change course yeah. on this, and, and there's been long speculation about Hunter pinning Benoit on TV. Of course, it's Benoit's first television match, and... Bruce and I have argued this point forever, but in hindsight, would it have hurt Hunter for Benoit to beat him? I mean, he was a made man at that point, but it would have made Benoit. 
to be Hunter. Well, I think you could argue Hunter had the main event with me. Sure. And I don't think guys should be losing main events. Even though it's with some schmas or some such? Uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with that. Okay. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not saying Benoit had to lose. It could have. Uh, Maybe don't put him against Hunter. Yeah, the yeah. Somebody uh, else. Wrong opponent. Right. But I, I am a big fan of, of the guy main event guys looking strong. So I know X-Pac has discussed this uh, before, saying that we, you know, you, you, you're going to have friction when you're trying to put together matches, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, um, Sean wanted to have a good competitive match. You get a lot of, and I was like, Sean, I just feel like I need to look strong. I need to look strong. And, you know, so you get the thing. To, it, it's not always in the best interest to have a five, to have a four star or five star match. Yeah, sometimes, trying to tell a story. yeah, you're, you're trying to tell that story. And uh, I was driving, I think, be, by virtue of the fact that I was in Louisiana, I remember who worked in Louisiana towns for TNA and um oh man I can't remember the guy Bob was it Bob Ryder? Yeah Bob Ryder Bob yeah, Ryder the guy. one the one who's passed away not yes, the, Bob yeah Bob Ryder Bob was a little angry at me for choosing to drive uh to Louisiana from uh where I was at that point I was we lived in Florida at that time and I said Bob here's the thing uh, the weather was really bad I said, here's the thing, it's out of my control. If if I leave it up to the airlines to make the decision, whether or not I make the town is up to them. Yeah. Once I get behind the wheel, it's up to me. Yep. So I'll be there. I might be cutting and might be cutting it close, but I'll be there. And I had just invested some money in having a real kick-ass stereo put in my, you know, 2003 minivan because I was logging a lot of miles. And man, that thing, the volume, where you could really crank some tunes in that thing. But the problem with cranking the tunes is if you have it at nine or go to 11, as Nigel. Uh, sure. <laughs> Final Tap reference here. What was Nigel's last name? Tufnell. Nigel Tufnell from Spinal Tap. Yeah, his amplifier went up to 11. The problem is if you, you're at 11 all the time, there's nowhere to go. Like when you want to kick it up a notch for uh, the live version of Springsteen's Youngstown and you've been at 11 for, you know, ballads, you have nowhere to go. Yeah. So when you're dry, making those loops, you got to have the volume down and up. And now you're peaking when with the songs you really like. And the problem is if everybody on a card is trying to have the best match they can have, that you're essentially asking the crowd to listen to. Uh, music at volume 11, and then the main right. event goes, and there's nowhere to go because yeah. everybody's trying to have the best match they can. And while that's admirable, it is going to be somebody's role every night, or at least it should be, to be that guy that allows people to catch their breath. Yeah. And so I do believe there's a time to catch your breath. There's a time to have a popcorn match. There's a time for people to take a restroom break if they need it. And there's a time to turn the volume up to 11. But not every night, not every match. Well, you guys turned it up to 11 that night. The main event, uh, probably one of the best in history up to that point, is Hunter teaming with X-Pac, Benoit, Saturn, and Malenko. They're going to take on you, Rikishi, Too Cool, and The Rock. And uh, in hindsight, the card or the match sounds a little crazy, but, Lord, the crowd is crazy the, that night. This, I've talked about this with Scotty Tuhati over the years. It's one of the things we gravitate towards, saying, to me, that was the high water mark for... WWE as a promotion in the Attitude Era because the reaction to every Everything. single thing was super crazy. Technically, Too Cool was Rikishi. Was it, they were a great act, but it's like, were they a main of not, right. not really. You know, there's a little, you know, the comedy and they did a lot of great stuff. Super over. But on that night, they were fully accepted yes. in that role and people were losing their minds for every single thing we did. And uh, this is what I was about. I, I, I don't remember a single thing about the match. I don't remember a single move that I did, but I just remember the reaction. You remember the way it made you feel. Yeah, yeah. And it was, oh, it was just phenomenal. And so uh, the Radicals were doing something right. Because, yeah. And the push was doing something. So maybe they had to play that hand, that heel hand earlier than they would have if Eddie had not been injured. And maybe the wins and losses didn't come the right way at the right time. But man, that night in Dallas, that was just electrifying. If you could change one thing about your home, what would it be? 
a new kitchen, a new master bath, maybe put in a pool. What if you could do it with no money out of pocket and cheaper monthly payments? Savewithconrad.com can help, and you can even skip your next two house payments. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender, savewithconrad.com. February 10th, Vince McMahon does a media tour, not just for the WWF, but the XFL launch. And he compared your wife to Robin Givens, <laughs> referencing the Mike Tyson interview that's pretty famous now. Yeah. And you wrote in your book that you were none too happy. About oh, that. man. Yeah. Well, I guess I was over enough to where I could, you know, take exception to that and then write about it publicly in a WWE book. Yeah. And Vince was saying, well, oh, now this is 2020 does some creative editing is uh, my wife would say. And I think here's the thing. My wife, since we met in 1990 has heard it all oh, wrestling's fake you know this that and she knows that her husband's you know hurting she's trying in her own way to stand up for the business but she's doing it in a way that's not flattering to me so she's going he walks like a 90 year old man and then i was it but like a sexy 90 year old man but as it's their prerogative to cut out the humorous things sure and they edit it in a way that makes it look like I'm on my last legs. Right. You know, and so now it brings up this ironic uh, uh, period of time, the moment of irony, where instead of trying to convince people that I'm getting hurt worse than they think I am, which is not at all. If you're an, if you're a pure out cynic, you will explain away anything you say by going, it's fake. Oh, it's fake. But, but how do you explain that? Well, it's fake. Well, tell me what's fake about that. I had a um, one of my best friends. His dad was always really cynical about wrestling. Mm. And he must have studied the photo of me in midair uh, when Eric Embry, you know, pushed me off the scaffold in Dallas and I broke my wrist. He just studied it, like looking for a loophole. And I'm like... Here's the cast up to here. Like, yeah. I'll show you the x-rays if you want. Like, I, I felt I got hurt. Like I was on a 20-foot scaffold. It's not a wise thing to be, especially it's not a great place for a guy who maxed out with right. four pull-ups in, you know, fifth grade gym class to be. You really need to be able to pull and, you know, you need some skills and physical tools I didn't have. Um, but no doubt that I was, I'd been injured many times over the course of the career. So in my own way, my wife's trying to stick up for me talking about the ramifications and she's talking about the head injuries and not knowing where I am. And, but we're not getting the full picture because, because I'm doing better than the show would indicate. But now when I'm stopped by strangers in an airport who weren't even necessarily wrestling fans, but people who watched uh, uh, 2020, I remember one woman saying, I'm praying for you. And I said, it's not like that every night. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the the match with The Rock was bad, right? That went over the edge. That was edge. a one-off. That pushed the envelope way, you know, in a way that should never be pushed again. We crossed the line. Oh, we went way over the line. Uh, that night. And Helena Cell was, you know, it was a, a laundry list of injuries, but it's not that bad. So now instead of saying, hey, actually, we do get hurt. Now I'm trying to protect the business by going, it's not that bad. Like, yeah. I'm not as bad off as we are. And so Vince was trying to say that I was, a, when he spoke to me, he said, well, Mick, I was trying to say that you were sympathetic like Mike was, because as Robin Givens was talking about, you know, uh, but he was saying, she was saying some awful stuff about yes. Mike, right? Uh, and and Mike wasn't even interluding, you know, when she was saying these awful things he about his temper. There. And then my wife wasn't saying anything like that. She was saying that there'd been a fallout that people didn't appreciate. And I said, you weren't comparing me to Mike Tyson. You were comparing my wife to Robin Givens. That's not acceptable. So I guess, and Vince, I, I, I said last night to his credit, when he sees something and he's been wrong, as he was, you know, about, uh, you know, he may have hired me just to break Jim Ross's heart, you know, <laughs> and prove that someone Jim thought so highly of was, uh, you know, use bad word here, but just quoting uh, JR, quoting Vince, it's, it's the shits. He said, somebody you think so highly of turns out to be the shits. I'm going to hire him so you know what it's like to have your heart broken. But Undertaker stepped in. I don't have verification. I don't have to believe he stepped in. So, I want to work with I that guy. Work with that guy. We're going to do business. We're going to battle psychologically. And Vince, when Bruce Pritchard overheard the conversation I had with Sean backstage about dude love and how I deep down wanted to be a character much closer to Shawn Michaels than the character of mankind, 
Bruce went to Vince and said, man, he's got an interesting story and he's got video to back it up. And then Vince pushed me in a way I never would have believed and made me a bigger star by admitting that he was wrong. And so Vince will do that. He will call. And he called my wife and he apologized. The last time I interacted with Vince was when I was really angry about um, uh, what he did with Thea Trinidad. Uh, geez, isn't that awful? Thea is about the only person I remember by real name. <laughs> What's it? The, the, the queen of the... Selena Vega. Selena Vega. Yeah, geez. How can I not... But Selena Vega didn't get to work on uh, the, the memorial, memorial show. The anniversary. And, uh, kind of the return of WWE to NYC after two years. Yeah, and also the memorial 20 years, and uh, Selena lost her, Thea lost her dad that day in the towers. And I was freaking angry, you know? I was really angry. And uh, I don't know Thea that well, but I've known her since she got in the business, you yeah. know? It was just this bright, starry-eyed young, you know, young lady. And uh, I think I'm, I, I think I can say what I said to Vince. With, uh, I think if I say what Vince said to me via text message, that's a betraying a trust. But, and I told uh, Thea the same thing. I can tell you what I said. I can't tell you what Vince replied. And I said, look, you, you, know, you know, you've got issue with her because she's a strong, I didn't say that he had issues with her. I said, she's a strong-willed young lady because she'd had the issue be wanting to do her own uh, Twitch, Twitch or, or whatever, it whatever it was. Yeah. Vince is still not good at relinquishing control. control. And I think she ever, and look, here's the thing. The, I'm, and I said last night, I love WWE, but deep down, if I'm going to have a loyalty, it's to the men and women who do the work. And I believe all of us should have opportunities to succeed after wrestling. And if you're able to take, because it's a limited run. You know, it's a limited run and it's just in the nature of the beast that somebody's going to come in and take your spot. And I believe we all have to have the opportunity to take what we've done for the company and do something else with it. So I'm in her favor for Twitch, whatever it might, whatever it might happen to be. And so that's why I alluded to her as being a strong willed young lady. I said, but I guarantee you there's a part of her. Every time September 11th rolls around, that is still that nine or 10 year old girl who misses yeah. her dad. And Thea got back to me. She said, how did you know? How did you know? Like, that's exactly how I feel. So the reason I'm bringing up the Thea Trinidad situation is that Vince called her and he apologized. And he said, he had apologized that day too. Uh, he apologized. And I would say that he has made it up to her. Oh, yeah. He has made it up to her. So I think uh, Vince deserves a lot of credit for having the capability of changing his mind, admitting when he was wrong. But he 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 admits when he was wrong and moves on. Yeah. It's not as big a deal to him as it is to us. But he will do it, and he did it that night, uh, you know, that with my character, which was, you know, obviously you and I are not having this conversation if he had – Refuse to acknowledge that he might have been wrong about. Me. So Vince, while he's doing this PR tour about the WWE okay, right. and and uh, the XFL, he says that the Hell in a Cell match, of course, he's hyped for the next pay per view, is going to have precautions in place to make sure you don't hurt yourself. <laughs> and I'm sure that probably kills some of your spirit. Like, man, we've sold this match as being the ultimate, and now you're saying, well, we won't let him hurt himself. I'm going to put the teeth in in case you want to go with that option. Uh, <laughs> well, look, whether or not Vince says he's going to put precautions in place, he also firmly told Hunter and I before the Royal Rumble match, no thumbtacks. And then he was about eight feet away and Hunter walking away and Hunter goes, you, you already put him under the ring, right? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. So we know we're going to defy Vince and, that, and we're going to ask for forgiveness afterwards. I don't even think he got angry at us after the fact. We used the tax, and I only took a backdrop in them. It took the, you know, the pedigree, textbook perfect pedigree. So I don't know if I, I know he didn't want me going off the top. Um, so, but no, we didn't, we didn't have to go through the top because I ended up going through the cell. Well, you, you do a promo from the top of the cage yeah. beforehand, promising to drop an elbow from the top of the cage onto Hunter. But I've always wondered, like, on some level, 
it's got to be this almost insurmountable amount of pressure in your mind. Yeah. How could you ever live up yeah, to the first it was, one? Yeah. Like, how could you ever do that? You've set the bar so high that I don't know what else there is to do at that point, right? Yeah. So the st- I thought the storytelling at No Way Out was really good. And I, and I wrote in the book that I couldn't understand the lack of reaction, you know, especially when we go for pinfalls. There was none of that, ooh, oh, it's a close one. But the moment I took the stairs and threw them at the, uh, threw them at Hunter, he ducks and <clears throat> they go stairs, you know, break the, uh, so too much, you know, like went through too easily. Like uh, I thought it was just going to be like a little tear and that when I dove through the cell to break it open, it was already pretty much wide open after the stairs went through it. But then you felt that Hartford Civic Center come alive because now it's almost like we are walking out of black and white Kansas into brilliant Technicolor Oz because now we're in the land that we promised them. So it even as even the moment they come alive, it dawns on me, they weren't reacting because we've promised them. And I do realize that we are in a sense baiting and switching. Uh, but in my opinion, as long as my goal, even as the character was to drop that elbow, we're not lying to them. Yeah. And I don't think anybody after that match, you know, nobody was disappointed. Disappointed because of the lengths we went to, and because of the way that that match finished. So on our way to the show, uh, you and Rock team up one last time, and you defeat the Outlaws at the SmackDown taping. What's your relationship like with Rock at that point? You know what? I don't think either one of us appreciated how special that pairing was. And that's something we had a really good talk about uh, going back, you know, seven or eight years now. Um, both of us just thought it was something we were doing on the way to something else, which was originally supposed to be my heel turn, supposed to turn on the rock. But in order for me to turn on the rock, he had to let down his guard and yep. welcome mankind into his heart. And two things happened. One, that didn't happen as readily as I thought it would. And two, I realized that what we were doing, not only is a rock and sock connection, well, I didn't fully appreciate the fact that we were connecting with people and that fans were loving this time period with us together. I did appreciate that the connections I was making were a step above anything I had ever done before. And I didn't want, did not want to give that away just for the sake of a pay-per-view match, even if it was going to be with the rock and even if it was going to be a big, uh, 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 in, you know, a great payout because main eventing a pay per view that did well was a, it was a sizable check that you would get, and uh, the hierarchy of checks, you know, it was it was very much favored for the main event guys. Sure, you know, I would I even went and argued on behalf of a few guys who were in if not semi main events and really important matches and weren't compensated what I thought was fairly, but when you're the guy getting the main event checks, you're not complaining about that. You know, you right. complain about that after the fact, two, three years. But, um, I think rock and mankind would have been a big singles match if I turned on him, but I don't think I would have, I just felt like I would have been turning my back on something that felt real. The connection that I had was real, but I don't think either rock or I appreciated that what was in a sense a botched experiment because we didn't get the turn out of it, that we were creating memories for people. They weren't just one-offs. You know, a lot of the stuff we did was off the cuff. Uh, the playing around with his catchphrases. Right. You know, like that wasn't something we discussed. Him shooting me that look when I'm doing it, if you smell, la, 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 and the ca- way the camera shot is, he just shoots me that glance and shut up immediately. Then the chemistry was so good I just, I don't think I appreciated that it was our final match. I don't think either one of us appreciated that fans were going to be talking about what we did as being up there among the greatest things they'd ever seen, despite the fact that the teaming was only like 10 weeks long, right? Yeah. It was really brief. I I even was watching, you know, WWE's greatest tag teams, and they put me in Rocket like four. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> We had 20 matches. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, doing, yeah. <laughs> and I'd be, you'd be hard-pressed for someone to remember one of those matches because, you know, what we did in the matches because it was all about 
the friendship and the camaraderie. So I think that really should, was, was good. Uh, we appreciated what we had done, but we're also kind of got blinders on because nature of the beast too, though, right? Uh, yeah, it's the nature of the beast. And I, and here's one of the things I've written about in the past saying there's like a honeymoon period. Uh, and it's a really special time. And I'm not saying it's a bromance thing, but it's a cool thing to sit with the guy that, you know, who you've beaten each other half to death in the name of entertainment. And then you watch your match uh, in catering. And if it's the end of that run, if it's the end of your marriage, then essentially you now become competition. You're no longer partners. You now become competition. And you have that great moment where you watch it, you thank each, you, each other, hug it out, and now you're competition. And so in a way, you don't become – like Steve Vost and I are close friends, but not because we were up near the top of the ladder or he was at the very top and I was a couple rungs behind. We're close friends because of what we went through in WCW. Right. And the shared pursuit. And, uh, you know, the, the shared frustration with, we, we thought was, you know, the glass ceiling trying to make, it. yeah, you don't become great friends. And this is my history with the guys you have the big matches with because inevitably you're competing, you're competing with each other. So then you have the big raw from the Georgia dome, uh, considering how important Atlanta has been for your career. I'm sure that was a highlight 25,000 fans here for a raw. Uh, Hunter's going to lay you out with a pedigree before you cut a promo on Hunter about dropping the elbow. And the main event is uh, big show Hunter and X-Pac taking on you rock and Kane, and you get hit with a fire extinguisher and pinned. And then we have the, uh, go home Smackdown for you and Hunter, but you wrote this in your book on February 24th. I gave my last promo before the big match in it. I tried to distance myself from the retirement ripoffs without blatantly saying I'm going to lose. I tried to convey the feeling that I was indeed going to some experts felt it was the best interview of my career. Some of the wrestlers cried backstage as they listened. Personally, I was disappointed. I felt so full of emotion backstage, but when the music hit and the crowd popped, I became a performer. I wanted to tell a story, but gave into the current pressure for catchphrases and instant gratification. I think I lost my nerve. I told the story, which included my Joe Frazier analogy. But I yelled too much. Yeah. And while I was doing it, I felt like I was failing myself by turning a special situation into a quote unquote wrestling promo. Above all else, I used a word that would come back to haunt me prostitute. <laughs> prostitute, as in, I'm not going to be like those other guys who prostitute their name in a retirement match only to come back after a six week vacation. I wanted the word to be strong. I wanted prostitute to tell fans I was serious about the match stipulations. I wanted prostitute to increase buy rates. And most of all, I wanted the word prostitute from saving to save me from becoming a real one. Wrestling may not have been my first love in life, but it was certainly the first one to love me back. I honestly didn't know if I could leave it. Prostitute was my insurance policy. Wow. That's profound, man. That's I guess I gotta go back and read Foley's good. Yeah, I do remember being disappointed with that promo, and I do remember, actually, I think Meltzer thought it was among the best things I'd ever done, and I do remember thinking, I'm yelling too much, I'm yelling too much. I, I was telling, trying to tell a story about Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, and the thrill in Manila. There's a great book called The Ghosts of Manila about how neither one of those men was ever the same after that match. Uh, I'm getting the, go the goosebumps again, you know? And it also talked about how styles make the matches and i know i'm going off into some no, strange we love territory here but uh so uh it's maintained this this great book that uh uh george foreman had knocked joe frazier out in two matches in brutal and quick fashion no but five knocked him down five times i think in one round in nassau coliseum so, so george foreman was always going to destroy joe frazier Muhammad Ali would have always found a way to beat George Foreman, but you put Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali in the ring, and it was their third fight, right? Uh, Foreman won the first one, uh, knocked down Ali, I think, in Madison Square Garden. Um, this is after Ali came back from the time, you know, uh, his suspension for, mm -hmm. you know, taking a stand against uh, refusing to be drafted. For the, this is going way, you know, history. Some people might go, this isn't what we're tuning in for, right? But it, I think it helps tell a story. Of course it does. Um, 
so that fight in, in Manila had been so incredible um, at the Araneta Coliseum. I only know that because we later went back and worked Manila. And uh, the son of the original Araneta, he was one of the wealthiest men in the uh, Philippines, but uh, went out of their way to be incredibly kind, especially to the family of the little girl who I sponsored in Philippines. So they were just, they was, family was petrified because they're it's a very modest, fa humble family with a dirt floor. And now they're in the home of one of the richest men. Wow. And, uh, and they wouldn't say, they wouldn't barely say a word, but two things happened. One was the kindness of Str Trish Stratus. It's extreme to the point where uh, the reason I mentioned Trish as being my fifth child on a promo is that every letter the girl wrote me from that point on said, how is Colette? How is Dewey? How is Noel? How is Mickey? How is Huey? How is Trish? That's <laughs> and the other thing was that uh, Jose Araneta spoke their, uh, they, it's not their language, their dialect. And so now you've got this extremely poor family and an extremely wealthy family, and they're connecting because they both speak the same dialect, which I thought was was really neat. But yeah, going, but yeah so we, we, I did get a chance to you know work in that Col the the Araneta Coliseum. So the match, it's one of the great fights you'll ever see. And the fourteenth round, what these guys, these two men, Ali and Frazier, done to each other is, you know, almost like beyond inhumane. You know, it's, nah, it's that's exact. It was it was extreme. And Frazier, the fight ends with Joe Frazier on a stool, sitting on a stool. And I just wondered, they threw in the towel. Nobody thought anything of him after that. And even as Hurt as he had genuinely been by Ali, he didn't understand Ali was hyping fights by calling him the gorilla. You know, hey, gorilla, we're in Manila. It's going to be a thriller and a chiller in Manila with a gorilla, and he's hyping a fight. Um, uh, Frazier took all that stuff really personally, and uh, he never, he did eventually forgive Ali, and I think they became close at the end. But I wondered how many times over the years Frazier had regretted not doing that 15th round. So I was trying to liken myself to being Joe Frazier and having the opportunity to do that final round, that I wasn't going to end my career sitting on a stool, which right. essentially I would have done if I'd retired the way Vince and I originally planned, which is you've had your last match. Right. You know, if Steve hadn't been hurt, that would have been my last match. If Eddie hadn't injured his elbow, I don't think I would have had that match with Hunter. And I wanted to, I wanted to set the bar really high by using the, you know, word prostitute. I knew I was losing, you know. I wanted people on a certain level to understand for real this was going to be the last time that I was ever going. To, that was in my mind. Oh my god, this is obviously absolutely the last time I will ever wrestle. And later on, I would say, you know, yeah, I did, did prostitute. I did, did come back strictly for the money for some of those matches. But at that point, the economy had collapsed, you know, and investment, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on. It's like, man, in 2007, you should consider yourself really lucky to have a good job. And if it requires you to work a few, and I overdid it when I got to TNA and to the point where you're getting concussions almost every time I stepped in the ring mm -hmm. and should have known. But we all think we're immortal. But I, going back to what I said, yeah, absolutely. I wanted to put a lot of pressure on myself so that people knew it was the last match, that I was using that word to prevent me. It was like a third rail, you know, couldn't step on that one. And so when I did come back with the short hair, shorter haircut, first real haircut I had in a while, um, came back in six weeks, and I was about 20 pounds heavier probably. You know, I put all that weight back on. And uh, my heart just wasn't in that main event, you yeah. know, because I felt like I had – gone back on, on that promise word. yeah for sure so here we are we're at the uh the match it's hard for connecticut uh, you wrote that you felt an immense amount of pressure yeah and uh, you were writing the have a nice day bonus chapter yeah and there was some heat and issues with vince and uh then you've got you know to go out here and put on your your swan song if you will uh you go 23 minutes and 59 seconds uh, Meltzer really, really liked the match. He gave it four and a half stars. He says, 
uh, in the observer here. It should be mentioned right up and right up front that Jim Ross did an amazing job getting over the drama of this match. It should also be mentioned that the cameras did zoom in on 12 fans holding up lettering of Foley will die. I'm not sure which was sadder, the 12 fans who thought it was cool to hold up or the director who thought it was cool to show those fans. Foley seemingly gave everything he had and more than made up for the fact that he can't physically do that much. He got his knees whipped hard into the steps, had the steps thrown at his head, and then Triple H pounded on the steps with a chair. Foley used the chair for a low blow and a double arm DDT on the chair and a leg sweep on the chairs for near falls. And then Triple H used a drop toe hold on the chair. He smashed Foley's head into the cage many times. However, Triple H bladed first after being catapulted into the cage. Foley grinded Triple H's head on the cage and hip tossed him into the cage. He came off the middle rope with a chair, taking a hard bump on his hip to the floor. It should be mentioned they had about a dozen padlocks on the cage to theoretically prevent them from escaping and going to the top. Finally, the gimmick section of the side of the cage was opened and Foley shoulder blocked himself through it and then bladed his arm big time and threw Triple H out. I'm still not comfortable with that term. He piled drove Triple H on a table that didn't break. Foley tried to climb the cage, but Stephanie McMahon pulled him down. Foley grabbed a barbed wire board he had stashed at ringside, and Triple H ran away, but Foley hit him with it. Triple H is climbing the cage at this point to escape. Foley climbs the cage, but Triple H got the barbed wire board and hit him with it. Foley took the big bump through the Spanish announce table and did the word you don't like. Uh, Foley kept trying to throw a chair to the top of the cage. I wouldn't like, make it. I did make it up there like six times in a row before the show ever started. So it was like, okay, I'm six for six. That's going to be no problem. But I was just worn out. And I remember I got that chair and it's like clanging right off near the top. And I also now, I also understand there are fans there. So if I throw this thing with a it bounces out, yeah, it bounces out. Or if I just throw it up and it drifts, drifts, right. You know, I'm going to have a, I could injure somebody. So I'm trying to get it up there. It's not, it's like we need, I felt like we needed that chair up there for whatever reason. Although we used the barbed wire uh, uh, two by four. Uh, the reason we didn't use the barbed wire bat is because Sting was using a bat. I so see. Vince didn't want to seem like we were copying Sting. I see. You know, I could say, hey, we could go back to the drug, you know, just say, hey, Foley's got that barbed wire bat in 95, you know. Even Negan, even Negan, when he wrote a birthday wish to me, uh, Negan from Walking Dead said, I may have borrowed a move or two. From the <laughs> uh, but that's the reason it was the board. Uh, but I, yeah, I couldn't make it up to the top. Go ahead. Anyway, he says, whatever spots were planned up there with it must have been next. And, and the camera pulled away from the action, probably due to the fear he was really hurt since he couldn't throw the chairs. He climbed the cage and they fought with the barbed wire board and took bumps on the reinforced parts of the cage, including a suplex and a DDT. And then Foley set the board on fire, but the fire was never part of the match other than the visual. He then took a backdrop onto the gimmicks part of the cage and Foley went through, taking the bump perfectly. As the match went on, while everyone was looking at them on top of the cage, they had workers underneath gimmicking the section of the ring under the cage, removing the boards so he could essentially fall on a mattress-like surface and not be injured. Nevertheless, any bad angle from that height, even on a mattress, could have been scary. Foley sold the huge fall, got hit with the pedigree and was pinned. The stretcher came out, and as per his interview, he got up and left on his own power with tears in his eyes. Four and a half stars. Pretty awesome match. Yeah, it was powerful storytelling. And, uh, you know, you can find probably uh, a couple matches every month that technically are going to be better. You're going to find a five. But, man, to tell that story. The emotional it's, it's investment. About, it's about images. It's about creating moments. It's difficult these days to create moments e because the bar is set really high for televised matches. We sure. expect matches to be really good to great. And even when they're really the great, fans will hate a show in general because it's, uh, you know, the pushes are... Um, politics. In politics, yeah. I mean, so anyway, it's uh, fans' right to not enjoy a show, even if it's got some great wrestling in it. Point being, it takes more than great wrestling to make a great show. It does. And it takes more than a great match to make a great moment. Uh, and that's, I realized yeah, early on, uh, man, I don't, I don't have the physical capability of having, you know, the Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat type of match. 
you know, but I remembered the moments, the Snuka Morocco, mm -hmm. and that was an eight minute cage match, which even by the standards of the time, wasn't a great cage match until Snuka went up to the top. And that was on. And then it became one of the great iconic moments, but it was an iconic moment because the story leading up to it had been so good too. And the rivalry was there and Snuka had come off the top of the, 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 the cage against Backland just a couple of years before that. And so the buzz was in that arena at Madison Square Garden that it might happen again. So when Snooker just glancing up uh, skyward top of that cage was enough for that building to come unglued. So that was a moment. And going back, I think Triple H and I, you know, we we gave people a moment. Even with the match, I thought being a great match, it was more than just a great match. It was a great it was a great story and the culmination of a great story and a great moment. Do you remember who the agent was for that match? I don't, but I can tell you agents didn't have as much of a hand as they do now. Uh, and that they would listen to what you had to say. They might have some feedback. I don't remember there being a lot of feedback. I, um, I know you said earlier you were sort of going with uh, let's ask forgiveness rather than permission. Yeah. Was there anything that you did that when you came back through the curtain, Vince said, God damn it. No, not that night. Uh, not that night. Uh, I later went, my wife and I went to see Winona, and uh, there was someone on her crew had been underneath the ring hmm. uh, while Triple H and I were up there. And I don't know what it is they did, you know. Um, like with the table that that is so infamously broken, you know, at ringside, that thing is like the brick house that the third little pig wrote. Unless somebody does something to it, it's really well constructed. And it's only, you can go through it. I mean, I think the idea was, I thought a pile driver was going to put him through it. Um, and it didn't, you know. And especially as I found out uh, at Mania a couple months later, when I missed big time on that elbow, uh, I thought I broke my sternum. Yeah because you don't hit it flat, it's not gonna go. And if you know, I hit my sternum on the corner of that thing, and thought my body was broken in half. So um, yeah, uh, I, uh, I thought the table, I thought the table would go. I don't know why, I'm at a loss, I don't know. Pick up the pieces for me here. Do you think, um, you know, th there's a lot of, uh, for lack of a better word, magic involved in this. You need the cage to tear to get out, yeah. and then you need the cage to tear to get in, then you have to rearrange sort of a... Was Richie Posner involved in that? Is oh, he yeah, one of the yeah. unsung heroes of R that? <laughs> Richie was. I'm, I'm wondering whether I should tell the absolute truth about this match and then uh, ruin Let's the aura of it. I got to be honest. Uh, I got there to a warehouse, you know, a few nights before the show. It's in the Observer uh, that you did a walkthrough on the 23rd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's not in there is that Shane McMahon must have taken that bump three times in a row. Okay. <laughs> without any fear or hesitation whatsoever. <laughs> so he was like, no, it doesn't even. See, Shane's fearless. I might be courageous because I act in the face of fear. <laughs> Shane's fearless. He wasn't concerned at all. Uh, here, here you go. Boom, boom, boom. He, I don't know if he did three. He certainly did it once without any hesitation. And uh, I didn't think it was a perfect bump because I thought I went through awkwardly and I thought I had my hands out and my I thought I went butt first. I would have liked to have landed flat. And I thought the gimmicking was too much to where it looked like I landed on a pillow. Uh, I know, I know Jer <laughs> Jericho took a lot of flack for looking oh, yeah. like he landed on a pillow. That doesn't mean it was not a scary moment when Correct. he's descending from that height and it's not really up to him what it looks like once he lands. What do so, fans expect? Really fall on stainless steel? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's not Jericho's fault at all. No. Just like it wouldn't have been my fault if fans had chosen to accept that, uh, that I had landed on a pillow-like surface. My first thought when I hit was, uh, it didn't hurt enough to look good. Okay. Didn't knock the wind out of me. It may be slightly, but, you know, you compare that, uh, you know. You were expecting worse. Because of the damage that I'd done, which you can still see, you know, the, the teeth that were knocked out, you know, with the cell mat uh, in 98. So I'm still feeling the fallout from that. And I was unconscious for 42 seconds. Now you 
fast forward a, a year and a half and I, and I don't feel like I'm hurt enough for the bump to look good. But uh, I had accrued a lot of goodwill. There'd been a lot of good oh, storytelling. Yeah. And I guess I'm in the minority when I think it didn't look believable enough. Well, the shock uh, of that moment, you know, I mean, yeah. at that point we had seen it happen in ECW with Taz and Bam Bam Bigelow, but on a big yeah. stage, yeah. this was a major moment. And obviously it's going to happen again in the future, but to diminishing returns, because we've seen it at that point. But at this point, yeah. I mean, how do you top? getting thrown off it, getting thrown through it and breaking the ring was unbelievable. Did have a bump, uh, in mind if there was ever a cell two with me and undertaker. Really? Yeah, I did. What have. was that about? Okay. So keep the gimmick to cell in mind. This was around 2009, 2010. I was thinking, man, you know, I, if I and if I had come back to WWE at 250 and hadn't had the head injuries, like maybe I would have pushed for that. <clears throat> but I, you know, when I came back, I was heavy and it just wasn't in the cards. Uh, here comes, and I took the same bump I took with Big Show at Mania '99. You know, same bump I took with Leon White, but we did it on the wooden ramp, which should have should have should have been the. You wrote your time. book. You thought that would be it. I thought it'd be it. And I was yeah. trying to cash in on my Lloyd's of London policy. Yeah, couldn't believe that I wasn't, and I was definitely hurting, but not as injured as I thought I would be. But essentially, when people see that bump, you know, the one I did with Big Show, Big Show's four hundred and yeah. I'm on his back, and there's no magic there. If there's a tri if there's a secret to it, it is you just got to keep your bodies tight. Yeah. Because if he hits and there's a three inch gap, it's three bad. inch gap, and then I could break every rib in my. <laughs> there's no telling what damage we done. And I thought if Undertaker and I went up there, and man, this is the most you know, this is a iconic scene. Undertaker and Foley back up. Undertaker, Mankind, Undertaker, Foley back up on top of the cell. Here comes the Manable Claw, Mr. Sacco. Here I am up on Undertaker's back. But instead of just dropping backwards, he's doing it from 16 feet, may have been 20 by that point. And the key is we got to be tight. And the key is we're going to go right through that freaking ring. Boom, ching, just, and there'll be something underneath it, not on the surface. So I don't know how we, I want it to look more realistic. And I want it to be almost, you don't think you get some holy oh my gosh. for minutes. And then when that first hand, whoever it was, comes up out of there, I don't know how you finish from there. Uh, or maybe that's just the end of it, you know? But that was the big bump. Two stretcher that jobs. I never had. That two point. stretcher jobs. And uh, I'm getting the buzz again, you know? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we didn't see it. Because if something goes wrong there, <laughs> whoa. Yeah, there's no margin for error. Yeah. And and there's, you know, even though Undertaker would be on top of me, I don't know if I could do that to a guy with a family because that's so dangerous on his behalf too. And and clearly, you know, um, I would have been facing a very high risk of serious injury too. Yeah, no uh, kidding. I still believe I could have done it, and it would have been the greatest bump in the history professional wrestling let's uh read what you wrote from your book here my eyes welled up and my face began trembling the scene was perfect looking out at my career with a face full of blood sweat and tears slowly i turned just like the heroes of old i rode off into the sunset i felt an immediate sense of joy when i walked through the curtain vince wrapped me in a big hug despite my bloodied state and his expensive jacket hunter was through next and he hugged me as well even stephanie was up for a hug even with the knowledge that her dress would be history. Is this, is this a pretty perfect exit, do you think? Yeah, uh, it really is. It's the, this is the perfect, it's the perfect exit. And if I could rewrite my own history, I never would have wrestled. I would have had to come back against uh, Randy because you're allowed one comeback match. Uh, to true, I would have, I would have done the tag with the rock and followed it up with the match at Randy and then never wrestled again. Cause I think everyone accepts that you're going to have one comeback match. Uh, I wouldn't have done a match six weeks later. I would have done those two matches and that would have been it. And that would have meant no edge match in 2006, but you could tell 
just comparatively that I was down to 270 in uh, 2004. When I came back to WrestleIZ, I was back up over, up over 300 pounds. And I'd gone down from 330 to 270 in about six months' time. And I was, you know, really wanted to make that the best match it could possibly be. Came up short, I thought, in the tag team match, uh, the three on two at Mania. And then uh, acquitted myself. Is that the right word? Uh, a month later. Yeah, yeah. But if I could, yeah, that was a, that was a great ending to a career. Uh, Meltzer loved it too. He wrote, he was the classic overachiever who defied all the odds and was possibly the single greatest influence inside the ring of styles changing in the business of the past 10 years and a career destined because he wasn't that great athletically and didn't have what was believed to be the right look and physique for being mid card for life. He ended up when his career came to a close as one of the biggest five stars in North America and even as a best selling author. In the end, he went out with the glory, but without the storyline ego, putting over the world champion twice on pay-per-view in his own specialty matches, and even in tag matches on TV and in every angle over the final weeks of his career. Hunter Hearst Helmsley long since earned his spot as the top heel in the industry today, but if he is remembered someday as one of the top heels in history, he owes a lot of it to the credibility Foley gave him in these last two months. In many ways, from hard work to unselfishness about making others look good, to being a student of the game and probably truly loving pro wrestling more than nearly anything else. He gave enough of his body, perhaps parts of his brain. He gave it so willingly and so happily, whether big money was involved or not. And not for the selfish glory of bragging about scars in the bar to get over to nobody, but more to satisfy his own vision of what he wanted his role in something greater than him in this business to be. He should be admired for a few, for like few of any wrestlers of our generation. The fact that he was able to achieve his level of success without developing the star attitude that the majority of people who do it would develop and the quality of the book he wrote speaks volumes for him as a person. But as everyone knows, this story is not without a dark side. Because of his inventiveness, coming up with dangerous ways for a guy who should be able to blend into the crowd to get noticed by the crowd, the business is far more dangerous. Injuries are more plentiful and more severe than at any time. And this can't be blamed on him as those trends were going to happen anyway, but it was his success, not someone in ECW like Sabu who never performed them on a national stage that became the wrestler who inspired a large percentage of teenagers over the past three years that felt they were never going to have the body to be a pro wrestler or the athletic ability. They felt like they could emulate him and Hey, he's still alive walking around and he's a superstar. Maybe he moves a little slow, but he's living proof that you can do those things and get up from them. And that stardom, not all, not unlike Mick Foley some 20 years ago, probably from nowhere near his passion or verbal ability may come their way. And Foley did it without ending up like a zombie on painkillers, but nobody else in the profession is like him. Few were born with his mental toughness, his ability to absorb pain. And he's going to be testing that capacity now for the rest of his life. If you truly love the business, the history of the business, to do these things for an actual reason of being one of the legends in an industry that cares nothing about yesterday's legends. And most importantly, maybe one or two were smart enough and entertaining enough to come up with characters and more so interviews. And that's the difference between being Balls Mahoney and being Cactus Jack. Foley, after injuries, turned him into largely a comedy figure and a very successful one at that. For the last six months of 99, decided he would go with matches that would fit his legacy. So he put his body on the line and did things that most wrestlers in far better health wouldn't do in their wildest dreams. He pulled off two excellent matches and maybe an even better interview in his final weeks as a full-time active competitor. If he does retire, few, if any, ever went out in such a blaze of glory. Man, I think Dave's an underest underestimated writer. I agree. That's some great writing. It's really profound, especially when you have to turn out the volume stuff. Every week. He does. That's really, you know, you can say that he's wrong about something here or there, but, uh, man, that's that's some really good writing. It's really powerful. And to acknowledge, yeah, uh, the pros and cons of what I chose to do all these years later. Um, I talked about this a little bit last night uh man that every one of uh, well I'll, I'll limit it to the ones who love wrestling and uh there was something dave wrote uh 
about the, somebody wondered why uh, the success of Rock and Batista hadn't ushered in a new era of great physiques at the top of the card. And Dave said, well, it used to be bodybuilders could look at the product, see it as fake fighting, an easy way to make money and get in. And now anyone with half a brain can see that's not the case. They can see that it's really uh, difficult, takes a lot of skill and athleticism that honestly, you know, you didn't have to have. I, I, want, I don't know if I could have made it in this current day because I don't, I think you need more offense than I was capable of generating with my Come on. all right maybe uh, but i also had the toys to play with i don't know i don't know sure. you, know, you want to argue on my behalf that's another discussion for another day um we connect to characters we like yeah you know, yeah and, and it's like in my business and sales you do business with who you know like and trust we fans know like and trust you and that Thank will work you. in any era i appreciate that i appreciate that i went but i what i said last night is that all of us and i'm excluding the guys who get into it because they think they can make money because they're not they're the guys who don't have their hearts broken by the business but if you exceed succeed especially on that level or even if it's on a smaller level you're going to be searching for the rest of your life for something that makes you feel like you did when you were in the ring you're chasing that high forever. you're chasing that high forever and like anyone who's chased a high with you know through anything pharmaceuticals, else it's it's difficult to do right chasing the dragon is a, yeah the, and they say from what i know is i've never had my issues you know that uh you try to get it and you it is almost impossible to feel that way and so for me doing these shows in front of whether it's 400 people would be the high, very high end of what I do, or whether it's one of those shows where only 47 people show up, I can almost get back to that feeling I had when I was in the ring. But that came with a lot of hard work and, um, and I'll say dedication. I really dedicated myself to trying to make the shows special. Um, but it's, it's really difficult to try to find something in life. So even the, the Cinderella story probably doesn't end that happily for Cinderella after she settles in with a guy she's known for three or four days and realizes there's life after, uh, you know, the gold medal. At, I, I wrote about Oksana Bayul. She wins a gold medal at age 16. And, uh, you know, I met her through, I met her a handful of times through uh, fundraisers. And uh, 16, you're on top of it. Where do you go from that? Where do you yeah. go? And so it's not any surprise that she's run into, you know, run into difficulties. Like Lindsay, child actor. Yeah, child. Lindsay Lohan was the one I'm thinking of. And, uh, man, I'm happy she looks great. And I had a dream, I think, that I saw. I did have a dream. But I saw Lindsay Lohan again because Noelle and Dewey met Lindsay Lohan when she was kind of dating uh, the oh, man, Aaron Carter. Okay. And she could not have been nicer to the children. And there's a great photo. And then uh, Lindsay's a Long Islander. So she was at a benefit I was at for Christmas, maybe six months later, a year later. And she's sitting next to me. First of all, couldn't have been nicer to the everyone who came through. I uh, sitting next to me because there was a line of people. This guy played for the Jets. Marty Lyons was part of the uh, New York Sack Exchange. The Jets teams were the great front four in the uh, 80s, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's four or five former Jets, and then there's the ch child actress who just had the huge success with Parent Trap, the washed-up wrestler. <laughs> and, uh, and so she and I, she's she's a kid. She's a superstar, but she's also a kid. Yeah. I don't know. And she's getting the phone call from Aaron. I don't know where, where this is going to go. And I feel like her big brother giving her advice. So uh, so anyway, I'm happy to see Lindsay looks healthy. and Yeah happy after going through what she did because where the heck do you go from there just right. like you said where do you go after you've done that not everybody can be a jody foster and you know and so forever. segue forever and do great roles and grow a lot of us don't, don't have those opportunities but one thing that dave wrote that thankfully has changed he talked about a business or a, a, a fandom that has no not respect but no real esteem for the legends of the past. Now this, we, this show was proof of that. Now we do. Yeah, yeah. This show, your show, like you said, we don't have we don't have to talk about the current product. Yeah, uh, we're taking people on a little ride down, a little trip down memory lane, 
Um, obviously, it's going off in all kinds of different uh, ways and tangents. And if people like my book and that style of writing, they'll probably enjoy the show. Um, oh, they're going to enjoy the show. Right. This show is uniquely you. And as we're winding down episode one, your debut podcast, what did you think? Feel good Man. about it? Yeah, it did feel good. I I still wonder, like, where do you go from here? Like, we've all only got a certain amount of stories. But the nice thing is, like, man, the jogging the memory. Yep. That's a big thing. Jogging the memory is a big thing. And there are going to be going to be times where I go, I don't remember a single thing about that match. Sure. Like, I, even in the case of that February 2000, 2000 match, I remember the reactions and it being a high water mark for the company. I don't remember what happened. I think that, and this is with a little bit of study, uh, that we can only take on and remember vividly the things that were really good and the mm -hmm. things that were really bad. We remember the matches that tanked completely. We remember the matches were on that phenomenal high, but there are some good matches in there in that mixture in the middle. I don't remember anything about some of them were, were really good matches. Sometimes yeah. you can remember with a jog, uh, you know, like jog that memory. I do remember that. But other times, no, don't remember a single thing about it. Whereas you take me back to where I was wrestling with Tom, for Tom Savoldi. I'll tell you exactly where the box <laughs> spot with uh, uh, with Salvatore, Tom Brandy is coming. Is I messed up the spot on my debut. So I'm going to remember that forever. And so... Uh, thank you for jogging some memories. I think uh, as I'm doing it, I'm thinking, yeah, people are going to like this. Oh, they're yeah, gonna they're like going to love it, man. They're going to like it. I think, you know, I have a much different style than than DDP would or Jake sure. would, you know. Uh, I've wondered how how it is that you can uh, maintain your passion, you know, with so many different people. But we all have unique stories. Yes. I think we all have unique stories to tell. And where I benefit, I believe, is that I feel free to exaggerate them. Hey, you know what? For the, your listening pleasure. I think the old Dustyism is uh, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. And uh, but I do want to ask about retirement matches. Then we'll wind this one down <laughs> yeah, sure. because I know this didn't wind up being your actual forever retirement yeah. match. Right. But a lot of guys don't ever even get the chance to have this sort of closure, if yeah. you will, even if it is short lived. Yeah. Um. We don't know, but I think a lot of folks are assuming we've probably seen Hunter's last match. I think so. And I think it's a shame that he didn't ever go into a match thinking this could be it. Now, we know when you walked out of the match, you thought that was it, and maybe yeah. that changed. But just the closure as a performer who got to live their dream in front of so many, I think you would want to soak it in one last time. And I think it's a shame that maybe some of those guys don't get that opportunity, but you did. Yeah, I do. Um I'm gonna, you know, gonna going to talk about the current product just for a moment. I love the the Lita Becky storyline. Sure. Uh, when Lita got her send off from WWE years ago, it was I, awful. it was awful. It, I know Edge is really angry. It had to have hurt Lita a great deal to be treated that disrespectfully on her way out, especially as Trish, her contemporary was given the the great send off mm -hmm. and Lita I, I just thought that was mean it was well, I was saying it's unnecessary it's unnecessary to even say that it was just cruel disrespectful mean it was demeaning disrespectful especially for someone who obviously was one of the greats of her era or any era so I love the fact that she's getting that send off now yes. and that there is an appreciation for the people who paved the way that wasn't there uh, you know, because WWE did not acknowledge those legends like I think they should have, give, with the exception of a few few cases. You know, Snooka, bringing up the Snooka uh, dive really meant a lot to his family. I remember a very young Tamina thanking me for bringing that up because she felt like it had a revitalized interest in her dad. But, um, yeah. It did for me. I, uh, I didn't know anything about that match until I saw your story with your interviews with uh, Ross in, in 97. Yeah. And then I, I went out of my way to find a tape of it. And I don't know that I would have without it. So thank you. Oh yeah. That's yeah. good. To, good to know. So going back to Lita, she's getting this great send off. She didn't have, but it just shows you that some really top superstars never got the chance to go out the way they wanted to, or should have. And you know, there are some uh, basketball players, they'll announce their retirement and then they get the send off everywhere they go. 
And then there are other people like Brady, just re- Tom Brady just retired. He could have had that last season. And I'm not sure we've seen the last of Tom anyway. Me but uh, I was in the crowd when Dirk Nowinski had his last uh, game at Madison Square Garden. And because he announced his retirement, because we knew that it was the last time he was gonna, we were going to see him, the crowd was chanting for Dirk. Yes. At that time, he wasn't playing too much. And when he came in and when he put in those points, people lost their mind because we want to have a chance to say, uh, we appreciate you. yeah, we appreciate you and thank you, um, you know, goodbye. And I think as fans, we we want those moments. We, you know, it's almost like we deserve the right to, to give that goodbye. Um uh, you know, I was really lucky to have had to have had that, and I think I did. I did uh, dilute my, uh, <laughs> you know, my career by coming back to the well way too often. But man, that was a great. That was a great send off. You may have been ready to go, but we weren't ready for you to go. So we were ready when he came back. Psst. Who's going to take care of your family if something happens to you? What would they do without your income? If you don't have a plan, you need to go to goliathlife.com. Get a quick quote for more than 20 carriers. You don't even have to leave the house. If you need a medical exam, they'll send somebody to your house or office. You're in total control. You pick the rates, you pick the payments, you pick the terms. You're in total control, but it gives you and your family peace of mind. What if something happens to your income? Hurry to goliathlife.com. And we'll always remember the way you made us feel. And you're making people feel really good these days on Cameo. And I, I, you've probably become the most prolific Cameo artist in the wrestling game. And uh, as the story goes, you're actually supposed to deliver one today. Oh, yeah, I said yeah do you want to see uh, uh you want to see a cameo absolutely in action? why not all right i will tell you that um i i was with a different company for about a year and i didn't i don't like it uh i there was one specific example uh somebody asked me to take sides in the fabled rangers celtics soccer with football in scotland and i knew there'd been deaths over this rivalry so i said Listen, it's just a game. I prefaced it in every way you could preface by saying, before I said go Rangers, prefaced it by saying it's a game, nobody should die. And then this guy on a podcast, Foley's a Rangers fan, go Rangers. And and then there were some people who were just taking what I said and now making it part of their your show. And it was like, I don't, I'm not getting the gratification. I don't think I'm good at it. And so fast forward, here's the pandemic. I do a thousand free videos. I don't know if you remember that. Two weeks into the pandemic, a thousand free videos. And so I feel like everyone who's wanted a video. No, the videos I'm giving, the thousand free ones are in the 30 second to one minute area. You know, hey, there's a light at the end of the corner. Just want you to know, hardcore legends thinking, whatever it's going to be. Uh, And so I had resisted the urge, even when guys were telling me, Jake Roberts told me, brother, you know, it's, it's great, extra money. I resisted the urge, but now I'm sitting at home. My entire schedule has been wiped out for six months, at least because of the pandemic. Nothing on the surface, on the horizon. And why not? And I start doing them. And I realize, well, now I'm getting that performing bug. There you go. I'm getting the creativity. And as I start doing them, I start saying, well, I can put on. It doesn't have to be a 30 second to one minute, uh, you know, how are you? Happy birthday. Like it can take on a life of its own. I started doing the voices of the characters. Then I ordered uh, uh, the Amazon (laughs) mankind mask. So now I got to zoom in really close so nobody can see that I'm a guy with short hair. And so my. uh, Wait a minute. You ordered a mankind mask? Oh, yeah. yeah, I ordered the mankind mask from Amazon. (laughs) Yeah, I sure did. And last night I was on uh, Etsy talking with someone in Bangkok, Thailand, who's sending me two masks because the masks are not made to be taken off. The whole idea when I do a you when I do the changing characters, right, uh, is that on one level, oh, it's an apple core. I don't know why that's there. Um, a fan, they absolutely know that I'm the same guy. Of course, but you're just you know you're you're reminding them of a time. 
when you were somebody special in their life, and apparently you still are because somebody has seen fit to part with some money, you know, 125, that's, that's no small sum in today's day and age. People work hard for that stuff. So if I can do the, the changes fast, now sometimes it's just, it's just dude love or it's just mankind. And I also, this is a bad, it's a crummy wig, but the thing about this wig is it's easy to take on and off without losing its, uh, its shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on, in order to do this fast, Cactus Jack, he plays minor roles. The only time he's ever seen, the only thing that separates me from being an old guy with a wig is now <laughs> I'm an old guy who's just had a hardcore match. And in order to make, uh, hold on a second, let me turn this thing on. I think I've turned it off so that we won't have any buzzing going on. By the way, if you'd like for Mick to do one of these for you, cameo.com is where to go. And and I've it, heard from Dallas and Jake that uh, it's actually a little better for the guys if you do it on your desktop as opposed to your mobile phone. But uh, because I take, because uh, I'm doing quick changes, it, it's got to be, it's got to be quick, right? So uh, I do it on a handheld because, because uh, I do. I mean, then pay. On and pay. Oh, because I guess Apple takes a bigger oh, bite. Oh, okay. Out of yes. Apple. So I'm saying yeah, to people out there, if they're wanting to buy one, it yeah. doesn't, no, they can still do it on their phone, but sure. instead of hitting the um, app, Apple takes a lot, a lot of money, brother. So yeah. if you could spend the extra couple minutes uh, doing it on cameo.com slash Mick Foley, uh, it's greatly appreciated. So let me see. We'll take you behind the scenes here. What, let's see what this gentleman wants. Joel from uh, he, him, from uh, 260, turning 42. Joel Van Brocklin is a huge wrestling fan, a Mick Foley fan. This is from his friends at Vox MD. Joel is a musician, performs as Ender Bowen. He's released a new album called The Art of Tactful Procrastination, EnderBowen.com. So no, okay, so no, here's... Turn on the camera. I don't have musical accompaniment here. I sometimes... well, it'll be added in post. All right. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Ready? So we are alive on this one. Three. Uh... <laughs> Ow! Joel, my friend, my good friend, do not adjust his nine eyeballs. I can assure you, they do just, is he just, oh, I just botched that. Let me try that. Come on. <laughs> Everyone makes mistakes. Joel. I'm going with too much deceiveth, knoweth, and uh, I'm stealing from the rock here. He, does, he doesn't need it anymore, right? Smacketh, layeth the smacketh down. <laughs> Ow. Joel, my man, my main man, do not adjust it thine eyeballs. They deceive you not. This is, in fact, Jack, exactly who I think you're thinking. I think you think I think you think it is. If the hip cat that I'm thinking, you think, I think, you think, I think you think it is, is none other than dude love. Yes, the hip is cat all the land and your favorite face of Foley in a runaway victory. I believe the exact quote you gave was that Cactus Jack, highly overrated, mankind, not a big deal to begin with. It was Dude Love who did this. 23 Skidoo, knock, need, love, dance, and it is Dude Love who will give to you his gift of song that goes something like this. Uh, the dude is wishing you a happy birthday, just like the ones you used to know. When those presents are open, here's this hip cat hoping you find a gift that you love, Joel. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa, dude, ah, wishing you a laid back birthday from that cake. Save me a slice. May your days be mellow and laid back. Ow. And I hope your birthday is nice. Dude love, sending you blessings of peace. Ow, love and understanding the hope and hope that all your days will be mellow and this birthday will be the hippest of them all. Oh, <laughs> you are so glad you got dude love instead of that overrated mankind or the never happening Cactus Jack. Wait, wait, wait hold on, I was just kidding. Cactus, I was just kidding. You better be kidding, dude. I don't kid around. Cactus Jack, fresh off a hardcore match. I hopped off a hospital gurney so I could say happy birthday and bang, 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 bang. Oh, my goodness. Joel, we have just seen two faces of Foley. And now you must know how Ebenezer Scrooge felt at the end of A Christmas Carol where he was visited by three 
spirits, Christmas past, present, yet to come. You've been visited by Two Faces of Foley, and now me, the hardcore legend. Joel, I want you to know this video comes to you courtesy of your friends at Vox MD and tell me you are a huge wrestling fan and also an incredible musician who performs as Ender Bowen. And you have, you re have released a new album called, this is a great, man, this, this is, I'm here with Conrad, Ty Conrad Thompson in the initial inaugural um, Foley is Pod podcast. Uh, but you have a great new album called The Art of Tactful Procrastination, uh, Ender Bowen. Dot com. So thank you so much for thinking of me to make this day nice, Joel. Really appreciate you being a fan. And thank you, Vox MD, for paying way too much for this video. Have a nice day. And cut. Bravo. And now, Joel, my man. So it's, my uh, man. Do not adjust it then, I both. So I try to exceed expectations. You did. You know? And sometimes I have a little musical accompaniment and I'll sit down and this is not a knock on anyone else who does it, but like, I just don't see Bret Hart writing lyrics to songs. I wouldn't you know, think like, so. Like, how do I, I need a, I need something. Let me transform my way into birthday. And that's why, you know, when I sit down, I go, as mankind, I don't have the mankind ma mask with me to make it really work, but it's like, all right, I've got this line where I say, the years, they go so fast. At every stop, you cheered me on, son. That night in Worcester, Mass, I won the belt. I beat Dwayne Johnson. Oh, good. That just is such, it makes me feel good. Awesome. So that every, so now you get six or seven songs, so you're not doing the same one over and over. But when I do that, it's like, yeah, I'm trying to make this the best video it can possibly be. And, uh, you know, that's, I think that shows where it's like, uh, people are uh, there, they are satisfied when you phone it in. Right. They that's what they expect. But I'll tell you, as somebody who's ordered four of them for myself, right? And I also ordered Nick Gage for my kids for Christmas. Really? And I made it clear to Nick that although I am not a dropper of the F bomb often, that without the F bomb, it's not a Nick Gage video, sure. you know. MBK, so Nick, all yeah. freaking day. Oh, all day, right? So the kids love that video. Um so I, I just, man, I love, I love doing these things. And, uh, you know, when I write something like that, that I think is good. Yeah. I get really elated about it and enjoy it. And I just, oh, so, so the comparison I have with the four that I've done, because you learn through your own experiences, um, the three of them have been really good. Right. And Janice from friends, what a dynamite, warm hearted, uh, video it was. And then one of them was, I was a little underwhelmed by one of my favorite Hallmark actresses who just seemed to be going through the motions. And I was like, okay, I know how it feels to get that video. And I know how it feels to get the Janice video. And I want people to feel the way Janice, same way I wanted people to feel the way that Snuka made me feel. Mm -hmm. When it comes to cameo, I want people to feel the way that I felt when Mag the, <laughs> Maggie Wheeler is the actress who bored Trey Janice. Like, she did a great job, and I want to hit that level every single time. So it's not just a cheap plug for cameo.com slash Mick Foley. No. Uh, not at all. It is uh, something I've done that really uh, it brings me great happiness. And I think the, re the part of the reason I've been really successful is that word gets around that they're, 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 they're really they're, good. They're, they're good, yeah. So I so grab one right now, or yeah. don't, because it's not a plug. It's, it's definitely not, not, it's a, not plug. a plug. It's the farthest thing ever. And I know DDP does a great job. Oh yeah, on his things because he believes in what he's doing. Yes. You know, to me, sometimes he overdoes the positivity. There's only so much positivity <laughs> that a man can take. I believe there's only so much positivity, and he's tiptoeing on that line of positivity. But if you're getting a DDP video that's and he wanting. tells you that's what he delivers and he delivers it because he believes every word he's doing. This goes back to Abdul the Butcher saying he's going to make it champ. I look over at him, Dallas, he's going to make it. He start. he gets into the business. I think he, I would say 47, but I think he was legit 37 
looked 47, right? For sure. A lot of living done. And, uh, he looked older. Like J.J. Dillon. He was born 50. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Abdullah said, he's going to make it, champ. Dallas? Why? He lives his gimmick. He lives his gimmick. So he does. He's not uh, He's not saying anything he doesn't believe 100%. And although I'm not aspiring to motivate people, I am aspiring to put big smiles on their faces, you know, and just something that makes you feel good for a while. Not a fleeting one, but, uh, you know, you, wow, you're buzzing for a few days over that. And you look back on it. And the same way I look back on wrestling, I want people to be happy with that purchase. They sure. come to my show, I want them to feel like that was the best way they could have spent their time and money. So, I, yeah, I'm still, I'm really happy to say I'm still trying to do my best, you know. Uh, we can tell with your debut episode, you know, I've done a lot of podcasts, as you know, and this is the best first episode. Really? Oh, nice. Ah. So you still got it. All right. But there's, we can climb higher mountains. Oh, too. we will. All right. We will. And we will next week. Tell your friends, uh, Foley is pod. And, uh, you can find us on all your social channels at Foley is pod. And, uh, we'll be back next week with more tales from Foley is pod. Thanks, man. Thank you, Conrad. Enjoyed it. <laughs>